All right, we're going to call this meeting to order. Okay. Public notice of this meeting pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act has been given by the board secretary on July 5th in the following manner. Posted notice on the school bulletin board at the administration building, transmitted to the Courier Post, Philadelphia Inquirer, and the, Chir yeah, the clerk of Cherry Hill Township. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mrs. Sugars, would you please call roll? Mrs. Arroyo? Here. Mrs. Stratton? Here. Mrs. Fleischer? Here. Mr. Mayor? Here. Dr. Rood? Here. Ms. Stern? Here. Mrs. Tong? Here. Mr. Avadia? Here. We have one board recognition this evening. The board is proud to recognize Barbara Wilson, NJSPRA Communicator of the Year. To give us some details and context, we turn it over to Dr. Malash. Thank you, Mr. Avadia. Uh, I'm very excited that the board has the opportunity this evening to recognize Mrs. Wilson. Uh, I'm going to ask Mrs. Wilson to take a walk up to the podium as I just introduced this a little bit. As you all know, Mrs. Wilson is our public information officer. Uh, she works in a department of one uh, here in the district. When Mrs. Wilson and I go out to the schools and, and we do our uh, town hall meetings with students, uh, I always like introducing her to the students because it puts a name uh, and a face together with a voice. Uh, most students and most families recognize Barbara's voice. Uh, as she is the voice when we have inclement weather, when we have announcements about school opening uh, and coming through. Um, NJ SPRA is the New Jersey School Public Relations Association, uh, which is a statewide organization. It's part of a national organization, the National School Public Relations Association. Uh, and Barbara was selected through a competitive process uh, as NJ SPRA's Communicator of the Year. Um, the applicants that came in, uh, we nominated her here from the school district. Uh, people wrote letters of recommendation for her. She had to provide information. Um, a number of her peers from across the state were also nominated. Uh, and then they used, they didn't decide within their own organization uh, who was going to be the winner. They used a panel of industry uh, professionals and college professors to make the determination. So it was a blind test and nobody that knew any of the candidates from the state of New Jersey. And from that, in this very difficult time, uh, Barbara was recognized as the NJ SPRA uh, Communicator of the Year. So incredibly excited for her. Um, she has led a charge uh, in the transformation of our communication process. And we always say communication is something we are constantly working on to improve. Uh, she has been recognized multiple times uh, by the state organization for individual projects and individual things that we've done here within the district. She is viewed truly as a leader in the state of New Jersey within the organization and among her peers. Um, so we're gonna ask her to say a few words. Congratulations, Barbara. Thank you, Dr. Molash. Um, thank you, board. Uh, it was truly an honor to be recognized this way um, and to receive this award. Um, and it, it's it's even more meaningful <clears throat> to have this recognition, recognition from all of you. So I, I thank you for that. Um, I have a great job. I, I have the wonderful, um, <laughs> I have the wonderful privilege of telling our school district stories, um, going out to the buildings, seeing the students, seeing the teachers, the staff. Um, so it, it's really, no, no day is ever the same. It's really um, a, a great um, responsibility and, and great privilege to be able to do this. So I thank you very much. I thank Dr. Malash for nominating me. Um, my husband came tonight. I thank him for his support. Um, <clears throat> I, I thank him for his encouragement for me to even apply for this job nine years ago. Um, so it, it's been a great run. I look forward to developing more forms of communication. Dr. Malash and I have a podcast we're going to get going this uh, this summer. And there's always something new, always new technology. So I, I look forward to the future as well. So thank you very much. I usually we would say join Mrs. Wilson in the hall, but I don't. I guess we, uh, so. Yeah, I think maybe selfie with uh, 
Wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, that moves us then, uh, after not having presentations or reports, to correspondence. Is there anyone on the board who would like to share correspondence this evening? We'll turn to Ms. Stern. Um, so yesterday, which was the 11th, I went to the um, subcommittee meeting of the Mental Health Task Force um, to, we, to discuss the S-12 procedure, which is the procedure for when there is a a risk concern um, with a student either for a suicide or a homicidal or ha intent to harm um, concerns. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion about the fact that um, our, especially our very young students um, and our elementary ages are, you know, sometimes, you know, kindergarten, first grade, second grade being referred um, for perhaps making a hand gesture with a gun, you know, like a, like a hand gesture looks like a gun or something or, or playing a game and, um, you know, and, and saying something that automatically requires them to be, to leave school, to be evaluated psychiatrically, um, and to be cleared to return to school. And just the disruption that, um, you know, a lot of, um, the students are experiencing and the families are finding it. And, and this, you know, it was time to kind of relook at this. Um, so that work continues. Um, this is, I think, the second meeting I'm reporting on, maybe the third. Um, I know Mrs. Weddington was there, um, uh, some other staff from um, different building levels who work with students um, and who really, you know, it, it was, I, I thought, a fantastic discussion. Um, definitely looking at uh, whether or not there needs to be um, more of a flexibility with um, allowing students to not have to go through that whole process. Um, also, there's, you know, a, a significant um, challenge right now to try to get mental health services, to try to get services for evaluation. So looking at are there ways to in the district can reach out to more providers, develop more relationships um, and, and really support those efforts. But overall, it's, it's just a it's time to revamp um, the process. It's worked very well. And quite honestly, it's it's meant that a lot of kids who were um, I mean, there are a lot of kids, you know, who've had to over the years be evaluated and, and some of those kids got help they really needed because of it. Um, other kids, it was more, you know, um, a little bit overdone, I guess, is why, why we're meeting to talk about it. So I think there's a lot of good stuff coming. I'm really excited for the work that continues. A lot of thought um, and also some standardization of processes are coming out of that, which is also really important. Um, and uh you know, just a great process overall. So I'm happy to be part of it. So that work continues and I'll keep reporting on it. Thank you. Anyone else with correspondence this evening? Okay. So normally I have a stack of correspondence. So I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Walsh to get me in the, uh, the cause we're doing uh, that summer food distribution. So I'm going to try to go to that and then I'll report next time. Um, <laughs> meanwhile, if you're looking to, uh, to book talent, you know, board of ed members are sometimes available. And so we'll see how that goes. All right, that moves us then, we'll close correspondence to, uh, to first public comment. Luckily, I have a little script. There will be two opportunities for public comment this evening. The first public comment session is for board action items only, items 18 through 20. There will be another public comment section for any topic at the end of the meeting. If you are a student in the district, you may comment on any agenda item or any item whatsoever during the first public comment period. Please identify yourself as a student. <clears throat> Online, I'd like you to put an S with a dash. And if you're in the room, um, please come up first if you're a student. If you'd like to speak now, please identify the agenda item if you're not a student uh, that you are speaking about. Clearly state your name and municipality to start. Um, your municipality uh, usually would be Cherry Hill, especially if you're a student. We will alternate between speakers here in the room and those that are online. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak. The timer on the screen will indicate the amount of time you have remaining. Cherry Hill is a community that values education and educational topics often bring out a passionate response. The Cherry Hill Board of Education supports a school climate in which our diversity is a source of strength and all are included. Respect is foundational in how we treat you, how we treat each other, and how we support our administration and staff in their essential work. Please join us in practicing the utmost respect for all. And I will start in the room if there is a student. 
not, I'll try to figure out the technology for a moment. I don't have a student online. Oh, but I do have a student in the room and the floor is yours. Just remember to start with your name and municipality. Good evening. Superintendent and Board of Education. My name is Liliana Melograna, a former Sharp student and rising sixth grader going to Beck. Thank you for listening me to me today. I want to thank the community for all the support they have shown towards all the, ch the our Cherry Hill teachers affected by the transfers. I have decided to speak today to show you my support for the teachers being transferred and mostly to support my dad. Mike Melograna, who has worked at East for 15 years. I ask Dr. Malosh and the board to rethink their decision to move all these teachers. I have heard that the number of teachers being transferred is most ever in Cherry Hill for one year, but never really heard a reason why they're being moved. In my mind, making a decision without a good reason doesn't make sense. These decisions have caused many of my friends and their parents to become angry or even sad. The teachers of Cherry Hill should not be forced to transfer. Not only can it have a negative effect on teachers, but on students and their families too. Students look forward to having a teacher for comfort, knowing that they care about kids. And now that they may be moved, these decisions are causing stress and anxiety and are having a negative impact. Students don't want to see their teachers get moved. Our voices are saying, we don't want this. Our teachers in Cherry Hill are a very important piece of our community in and out of the classroom. Many students have shared opinions similar to mine, no matter the grade they are in. Many teachers have worked at their school for a long period of time, making connections, formed relationships, and care a lot about the school and their students. This includes my dad. He is the proudest East alum, teacher and coach out there. For our family, East is our life. Everything we do supports East, and we love it that way. For him, this transfer, leaving East, is like moving out of your house when you don't want to, or like being divorced from something that you've always loved when you still love them. I'm only 11, and I've grown up at East, walking the halls, sitting on the sidelines for sports, watching the play, cheering on Spirit Week activity, and my favorite, watching my dad coach the soccer team. He, His dedication to East is clear. While I know my dad will still coach the East soccer team and give his passion and heart to Beck, this just doesn't does not seem right. While my friends and teammates are excited that I'm he may, up, he may end up as a Beck Bobcat. My dad is an East Cougar, an East Cougar for life. Please reconsider the transfers for my dad and the, all the great Cherry Hill teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um... So the, the person online is not a student. So if there's another student in the room, then I want to make sure that we have time to start. So seeing no one approach, we will turn to Dr. Podowitz, who has been waiting online uh, for his public comment. Floor is yours. Okay, my name is Jeff Podowitz. Uh, I live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Uh, it's, I'm commenting on 19.9, which is related to 19.5, and 21.1, which is the resolution that recently popped up, I think. Um, I, don't, I didn't see it this morning. Um, so, uh, which is a bond question authorizing. Um, all right, here we go. 19.9. Um, um, vote no on 19.9, which is the consent to approve the human negotiations. That's the, the, the consent approval, all right? Um, you could separate 19.5. What I want is, what I would, the reason I'm saying no to 19.9 is though, so that the, boards can, the board members can vote individually 
on 19.5 um, and, and, and have that recognized in public. So it's more about letting you vote however you want to as individuals as opposed to you just do the consent and, and, and that's it. And really no one hears much about it. So that's why I would say please forget about 19.9. As to 21.1, I read the proposal really, really quickly, and it appears that the bond's going to be for 63.9 63 million dollars. Um, and my question, one question is why? Why wasn't wasn't? It seems like the the New Jersey Commissioner of Education only made 332.5 million, million eligible. There's a difference. Is 30 is about $30 million less. Now, that's significant. That's about 10%. What happened? Why was that? Why did they refuse $30 million? Why weren't they eligible? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm a layman. But to me, it looked like it, it, it I mean, I mean oh, oh, more than that should have. It should have been, it should have been minimal. Also, there's that 40% of debt service. I thought we were getting less than 40% of debt service. Are we getting 40% of debt service? And then again, I, I, I think I, I know what debt service is, but can you kind of explain that? Because the full amount of, of the debt itself, not the note, but the total debt, will probably exceed $550 million. That's the full amount. Um, is that 40% or 30% of, of the $332 million? I guess those are my questions, and um, just take care. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move to the room. Um... And without a student, uh, anyone may approach for an agenda item. Yes, the floor is yours. Hi, my name is Tom Howard. I am a teacher at Cherry Hill High School East. I've been teaching there for 22 years. Uh, I spoke uh, back in April when the teacher transfers were first um, proposed, essentially. And I wanted to come here tonight once again to ask, beseech the board to reject these transfers. Uh, the transfer of any staff member is supposed to serve the best educational interest of the district for students. And while a number of these uh, transfers, since there are many, may indeed do that, uh, unfortunately, a number do not. Um, many of the uh, affected teachers at East, pillars of the community like Susan Dollarson, Mike Melagrana, and yes, Tom Rosenberg do not, do not, their transfers do not serve the educational interests of the district. In fact, they were not only poorly planned, they were callously executed um, as well. And Dr. Malash speaks about how teachers are the most valuable resource for the community. The way these transfers were uh, conducted to my East colleagues uh, belies that and causes me and others to question the, those, those, those comments. Um, in addition, it's not me, it's, I'm not the only one who feels this way. Since April, we've seen thousands of people across the district and the community stand up for East teachers like Mr. Malagrana, Ms. Dollar, Mr. Rosenberg, and others from writing letters to the board, students, alumni, community members, teachers, to making public comments. And yes, even thousands of East students walking out as a show of solidarity for the teachers because they know that their school will suffer if those teachers are moved. Now, again, some of these transfers, since there are a, a number, may indeed serve legitimate educational interests. But if there is just one that does not, since the board is collectively voting on all of these in one fell swoop, the board must reject them. If there is just one teacher whose transfer does not serve the educational interest of the district and the students. And as we have seen over these past months, many of these transfers do not, the board cannot, should not vote to move these along. And again, I beseech you to reject these transfers. Our students will not benefit from the movement of such pillars of the East community uh, as uh, the teachers I have mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the line for Craig Becker, I believe, and the floor is yours. Hi, sorry, it's Beth Becker, um, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. 
So um, in regards to the transfers, first of all, I just want to say um, there have been, you know, it's a personnel issue. There are uh, confidential, there's confidential information, first of all. Second of all, I'm really, I've been really uncomfortable with the public discourse around this with regard to teachers who are moving from the east side to the west side schools, um, saying that doesn't serve the district. West side students are part of the district. Um, I understand that uh, teachers who have been at a school for a very long time, I understand that's a difficult thing for the teacher. I understand that's a difficult thing for um, the students who've had the teachers several years in a row. Uh, you know, I understand it may affect extracurricular, but to say that um, moving a teacher from one place to another doesn't serve the district, which is what the district's goals are. I mean, it's to serve the entire district and all of these schools are in the district. Um, there are nine uh, teachers uh, transferring out of East, nine teachers transferring out of West. Um, there are, uh, from going from, if we're talking East side schools and West side schools, um, going from the East side to the West side, there's nine teachers. Going from the West side to the East side, there's 11 teachers. I haven't heard anybody on the West side say that, you know, oh, this is so horrible for the district. Um, and I'm saying this as an East alum and as a soon to be East parent, um, all of the schools that everyone's transferring into are all district schools and excellent teachers are going to be excellent teachers no matter where they are placed in the district. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else in the room like to come forward? If not, oh, okay, go ahead. The uh, floor is yours. Hi, my name is Dina Friedman and I've been a teacher at Cherry Hill East for 25 years. I teach high school math. I think I've had some of your children. Um, so for 25 years, I have been at East from the beginning. They told us to get involved, get involved. We have been told during professional development days over and over to make connections with our students and their families. Here are some of my observations of teachers making connections. I have seen East alum Rachel Friedman teach and coach the debate team. She spends her weekends with these wonderful students and their families. I have seen East alum Tom Rosenberg grow the AP history program into something students enjoy talking about because they have a teacher who is passionate about his subject and it motivates them. I have seen East alum Michael Melagrana, you can ask him who his favorite math teacher is, return to coach his beloved soccer team to victories and wear the hot cougar suit to create excitement for our school. I have seen East alum Susan Dollarton attend all the basketball games to cheer them on as a teacher, just as she did as a student. She is the leader of cheer and support at East. I have seen one of our counselors, Kathleen Lynch, run the SAT testing program so smoothly that students are less stressed about these high stakes tests. What unites all things East is the staff. What unites any school is the staff. These staff members create the true nature of East, the pride, the motivation, the fun, and the safe haven for our students. Forcing staff to leave their home school, their family, is not good for them, nor the staff left, nor the school, and especially not the students. These teachers create dedication and inspiration for other staff members as well. To many of us, East is a culture, a family, a tradition. I could have stayed home tonight. I could have just gone on my vacation. I could be worried about being transferred myself, but I just keep hearing the words of Ellie Wazell in my head, and I quote, to remain silent and indifferent is the greatest sin of all. We are in front of your children every day. We do good and wonderful things for your children every day. We need to be valued, we need to be heard, and we should be respected. Please don't be silent. Please don't be indifferent. Please vote no to the staff transfers and let's continue to celebrate East and all the schools of Cherry Hill for what they offer this town. Thank you. Thank you. We will return to the line 
for Dave K. Um, and so, Dave, please start. Uh, sorry, please start with your full name and municipality. Good evening, Dave K. Cherry Hill. Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, I'd like to speak about the vote for the teacher transfers. Um, the board has been talking about for years how we listen to the students. And it seems like the students have spoken a lot and a lot and a lot. Social media, the walkout in board meetings, online in board meetings, the young lady, uh, the daughter of a teacher there tonight, begging and pleading that her father doesn't get transferred. I thoroughly believe that if this board does listen to the students voice as they have said in the past, and that's how we got an African American studies class is by student voice. I think you need to vote no on these transfers tonight and listen to your students and prove to your community that you do listen. If you decide to vote yes, in my mind, you don't listen to the students, you're backpedaling on your, on your word, and uh, you need to resign. Thank you. Thank you, Dave K. Anyone left in the room who would like to approach for public comment number one? Um, the floor would be yours if you do that. Yes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Steve Answer. I'm a 15 year employee of Cherry Hill Public Schools. Uh, those that know me know I'm usually not a, um, a, a shortness of words, except when I'm asked to speak about myself. Um, to give you a little bit of background about me, I'm 15 years in Cherry. Are you you're speaking about the transfers? Then? Yes, I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, 15 year um, Cherry Hill Public School employee uh, at East, at Carusi, and for the past 11 years at Cherry Hill West. And I thought it needed to be said to speak and come up and speak on behalf of these six Cherry Hill West teachers that are being forced transferred out of their districts. So during my time at Cherry Hill West, I've had the very unique privilege for 10 of my 11 years to build and develop a very successful broadcasting program at Cherry Hill West, where we've been able to document and archive and tell the stories of our Cherry Hill students in a time of their life where they may not think it's significant, but as they move on from Cherry Hill Public Schools, look very fondly on. I've also a teacher of English and a teacher of film appreciation during my time at Cherry Hill West. Also, for the past 12 years, I've had the honor of being one of the Carusi wrestling coaches that has helped build and maintain one of the most successful South Jersey middle school wrestling programs around. Our other coach, Mr. Joshua Hare, is another one of the teachers that is being forced transferred over to East. So him and I, over the past 12 years, have been coaching at Carusi, developing a very successful program of both young men and young women who have gone on to be very successful, not only high school wrestlers, but just successful people as they transition into high school. As I come up and as I speak on behalf of the teachers at Cherry Hill West, one of the things that I constantly come back to when dealing with this decision is what we as teachers have been asked to do for the past two and a half years. As we have been constantly asked to adjust and change and rethink education, we've been asked to show our students grace and compassion to make sure that whether or not a student was in our room or attending from home, we were giving them an environment where they felt welcome to make sure that they had a place that they could go through, that they had structure, that they had warmth, that they had compassion and knew that they had somebody that was looking out for their side. As I wrap up, the only thing that I ask is the same courtesies extended back to the teachers to give us the grace, to give us the compassion. Because for many of us working at the schools that we've been at, for a long time, and especially over the two and a half years, those schools became our source of a home. And I ask that as you're voting on that, to think about the same grace and compassion you're extending to the teachers that the teachers have been asked to extend to the kids for the past two and a half years. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we will, we don't have anyone on the line. Um, 
Okay, so we've got another speaker in the room. <clears throat> Alani Aris, Cherry Hill. Is 21.1 available to be spoken about now? It's a voting action item, but not listed under public comment. Okay. Uh, I want to thank the board and Garrison Architect for all of their hard work and bringing before the community this bond question that's uh, going to be, I guess, approved and go for vote in October. Thank you for all the hard work that was done for that. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm glad that my kids will hopefully benefit from this bond passing in October. Um, and I will be out there to push for this bond to pass uh, in Cherry Hill. I also wanted to speak on the teacher transfers. I don't remember what item number that is. As a parent of West Side students, six West Side students, I just wanna be very clear that I have heard great things about the teachers that are moving from the East Side to the West Side. And I hope that my children and their friends and the students in the district are able to benefit from those amazing and excellent teachers that are being moved to the West Side. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, anyone else for, okay, the floor is yours. But just, you know, I, I get, Sometimes I get a little bit lazy, but yeah, we do have to start with, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> agenda items, your name, municipality. Yep. Kind of stuff. Adam Greenbaum, Cherry Hill. Uh, I didn't realize we could talk about 21.1 uh, as well. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the bond question. Uh, I, I support it going over to the township for a vote in the fall. Um, our schools win awards for academic excellence, but you know we're all aware of the condition of them, the updates they need, the repairs. Uh, I've followed the development of the bond over the last year and a half, and uh, the needs of each building. Uh, I've also paid attention to a lot of the objections, uh, the line items that people have had concerns with, whether they think they're unnecessary or wasteful. And I won't talk about whether or not I agree with them or not, but what I think is worth recognizing is the scale of the bond and in comparison with, with these items, um, you know, whether it's a vestibule or HVAC issues or hazmat remediation, and you take all of those line items and you add them up and they come out to about one half of 1% of the total bond issue. So my takeaway there is even those who are opposed to the bond don't seem to have an issue with 99.5% of it. And I think that bodes very well. Uh, I'll be supporting the bond in the, in the fall and I hope my uh, fellow Cherry Hill residents will as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're going to close public comment one then. Um, for those that, oh, okay, all right. Uh, we will not do that, and we will allow for one more public comment. Good evening, everybody. Mike Malagran. I'm talking about transfers. Thank you for giving my daughter Liliana an opportunity to speak today. It was not something I expected, uh, not something I really knew about, but something I'm very proud of. So I appreciate that. Um, I mentioned she, this the first time I spoke to this board about. You know, my passion for Cherry Hill and being a very proud alumnus of our district, and I truly am. Um, my efforts and my passion and my heart will be applied at any school in which I work as I'm an employee of the district. You have my word on that. But I want to beat East. I have been heartbroken since April 13th, and I have no problem admitting that to this community. I appreciate the support from my colleagues. I appreciate the support from many people in this room in our community. I live here. I coach here. I coach youth sports here. Um, let's be honest, it's been a very hot topic of conversation since everything happened, and it's been very difficult to handle. Um, I want to thank my own family for their support, my wife, and my children, and my close-knit group of friends. Um, the support from the community has been phenomenal. I ask that this board please reconsider, not just for me, really for our students and what's best for them, no matter the school. All of our schools are great, and all of our families are great. We will all do our best but I need and want to remain at East. I'm asking you to do what's right. But again, you have my word that I will do my very best for all students in Cherry Hill, no matter the capacity in which I'm put in. In addition to that, I've heard many people talk negatively about this and want to take actions that don't help anybody. Notably the bond. For anyone who knows me and anyone who's listening, please vote for the bond in October. So our buildings and our students and our families need it. Thank you. Thank you. I want to be too quick on the trigger here. All right. So, uh, all right. So we will close public comment. Uh, there is another public comment section, uh, and on that one, you know, uh, the sky's the limit. 
Now, I will say that months ago, you, you'll recall that we moved away from Committee of the Whole. So this is a one-time gig for July, as is the custom, because tell, people tell me it quiets down over the summer. I, I, I don't know. I don't know, Ms. Stern, if you would concur with that. But anyway, so this is one of the things we always do. So we're back to Committee of the Whole, um, which does have some, some value, uh, some additional pluses as well. And you're about to see what they are, because we're going to turn to Mrs. Arroyo to present discussion items for CNI tonight. Thanks, Ben. So tonight we're going to focus on three areas, um, the theatrical play and productions and summer program update and start strong uh, testing summer, uh, September 2022. So Dr. Mahan. Dr. It's actually going to be Dr. Morton to oh, start thanks. us off. Uh, so I'm just going to present the uh, plays that we have had, the, the actual theatrical productions that we've had approved thus far. Uh, as you know, all of the theatrical productions that are put forth uh, go through a multi-step process of approval. It's read by the uh, the principal, read by myself, uh, Ms. Weatherington, and then finally by Dr. Malash as well uh, to ensure that they align with our 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 goals and, and ideals um, here in Cherry Hill. Uh, so the three that we will present there are two comedies that are uh, proposed for the fall uh, for Cherry Hill East: uh, the Canterville Ghost comedy about uh, an individual who buys um, the Canterville Chase. And he's unaware that there's there's a vindictive family ghost who's haunting that 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 um, that residence. Uh, so it's a comedy that, that allows for many students to take part in the ensemble and cast. Um, and in fact, there's a theme I think for each of the shows that have been that have been put forth by East uh, for uh, a variety of of cast members to be casted, a number of students to to have opportunities to have involvement and to have uh, roles as well in the shows. Uh, there's an, there's another that they have scheduled for the fall also called the Alibis. Um, Alibis seems like it's going to be a, a a wonderful a wonderful play. Uh, the Alibis is a, sort of like a whodunit type of scenario. It's a number of different plays where an individual um, is murdered and they try to figure out who 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 did it. And each one of the uh, suspects has a, like a hilariously absurd alibi. Uh, but nonetheless, seems like it'll be a very entertaining and fun-filled show. And then the final one that they have Spring musical will be uh, Into the Woods, um, classic Broadway musical, very popular. Uh, it, will pro it will provide for a very diverse casting, uh, large ensemble, uh, inclusion of instrumental musical, musical uh, program as well. So each of the three look to be outstanding and have gone through their approval process. Uh, the High School West, plays that have been submitted so far are undergoing the vetting process. We're still going through that. And I will present those uh, hopefully next month uh, if we're, we're through with that process. All right, I'll turn it over to Dr. Mahan now. Thank you, Dr. Morton. The next item on our agenda is regarding the summer programs. I just wanted to provide a summer program update. Last week, we welcomed happy parents and more importantly, happy students to Camp Kilmer and to the Elementary Summer Acceleration and Enrichment Program, all being housed at Camp Kilmer. I think it speaks to the success of the programs that we offered last year. Um, I was able to be on site at Camp Kilmer, but we also have students who are participating in programs at the middle school and high school level. My attention today will be on uh, the summer program at Camp Kilmer for Summer Acceleration and Enrichment. We welcomed approximately 236 students, 27 staff members, and students are able to participate in PE and health, mindset movement, and library. And over on Camp Kilmer, we welcomed approximately 150 students with more coming every day, where we provide ESL services, basic skills instruction, 15 staff members, computers, music, and physical education class. The high schools and middle schools are continuing to provide programs in mathematics, um, English language arts, 
and some elective based courses, as well as credit recovery courses for students in the high school who need support with credit completion. We're looking forward to continuing these programs again next year, and the response has been overwhelmingly positive for enrollment by our students. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Mallory to give a brief update on ESY, which also started last week. Good evening. I have to agree that there were a lot of happy faces. This is uh, our summer where we're back all in person, all our related services, all of our programs are, are back in person. Uh, our pre-K program is at our Malberg Early Childhood Center. Our elementary program is at Johnson Elementary. Our middle school and academy programs uh, started at Carusi. Um, students and staff are, are off to a great start. Um, they've gone above and beyond to ensure that the programs are successful. It really does take a village to get these programs going. Um, and I want to also just thank building administration. They allow us to house the programs um, and they help any way that they can. And staff, um, we had our, our maintenance staff after hours assisting. Ms. Sugars has helped tremendously to make sure the program um, is successful and it has started successful. Um, we also have our related our, our contracted providers um, in the program to ensure that students that are still struggling with some transitioning um, back to, to ESY are supported. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mallory. And I would also like to reiterate Summer programs throughout the district are an all hands on deck operation. Everyone from transportation to facilities to food services to the business office, teaching staff and administrators are all actively involved in making sure that our students have a wonderful experience. The next item on the agenda that we have for tonight is just an update. Start Strong testing will be back. Last year, due to the impacts of the school closure and COVID-19, Start Strong was put into place in this in the fall of 2021. Initially, we were told that that was going to be a one-year assessment. However, we have been informed that Start Strong testing will continue in the fall of 2022. That includes students testing in grades four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, and six and ELA and math, and then grades six, nine, and 12 for science. The testing window opens on August 31st and ends on September 30th. I just wanna say that again, the testing window opens on August 31st and ends on September 30th. That is a very tight time frame for us to return to school, have students acclimated into the school environment, and then to complete all of the testing within a very short three week window when we also have several days off from school. We're confident that our infrastructure for testing in terms of technology is poised and ready to support testing. And we're confident that our students will show academic growth. So just wanted you to be aware, we wanted to put it out in the atmosphere and in the community early. So parents are aware that, you know, possibly the second week of school students will be taking a standardized assessment that is provided to us by the New Jersey Department of Education. And again, that window is August 31st through September 30th. Mrs. Arroyo, I turn it back over to you. Thank you. I just, um, well, does anybody have any questions or comments? Okay, here. Yeah. Uh, just a question. Did, I don't, and if Dr. Mahan, if you already said this, I apologize if I missed it. Did you say how many students are participating in the um, high school and middle school uh, summer programming? I know I, you said the elementary, I got that number, but. I did not say the exact number. The high school and middle school program are a little bit more fluid. So I do not have an, ac not an accurate, a number right now. I can share that number with you at a later date. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, whether Friday memo or whatever works. Thank you. Thursday Welcome. memo this summer. Any other comments, Ben? You know, I just want to... Uh... So for the Start Strong, how does that compare to, to, to this current academic year? Because I'm thinking, um, person told me, I assume this is true, but that, you know, that the summer is really a, a, a difficult time to sustain learning considering we don't, you know, let's say, yeah. So anyway, but as we compare year over year, which of course what we want to do, I mean, is this a similar time frame to what it was last year? 
It is. That's a great question, question, Mr. Avadia. Yes, it is a similar time frame. The window is a little bit shorter, but only by maybe two or three weeks. Uh, we were testing uh, in the fall of 2021. I believe we started around the third week of school starting. This year, we will probably be starting in the second week of school. Does anyone else have any questions? I just, I wanted to add on to what Ben, did they say that it was helpful last year? Like, is there, like I did, I, since we weren't expecting it again, um, I don't know, did they give a reason why? They did not. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That would have been nice. Yeah. Um, and not all grades are testing? No, not all grades test. Uh, it's typically standardized testing when we provide the NJSLA testing in the fall, in the spring, that starts in third grade. This assessment starts in fourth grade, um, but encompasses a significant number of our grade levels, from fourth grade up and content areas. Thank you. And I um, just want to attest to being one of the happy parents dropping off over for summer enrichment, happy but late. <laughs> all week last week um, or Tuesday and Wednesday of last week. I'll get better, I promise. Um, probably not though. <laughs> they they actually, just from my personal experience and I rarely share things like this, that they were really excited when they got left. They talk about library um, and my, you know, that they got to bring books home over the summer. It was just really nice to see that they were still engaged and excited about being in the school setting. Um, and again, this is, this, we're going on to my second full year in, in public schools here. And the first year was during the pandemic virtually. So I, I like that they're enjoying going into a school building. So thank you for that. And I can, and I saw a lot of parents lined up waiting and there wasn't confusion at all. Like I was worried that I, we weren't going to be able to figure out pick up and drop off because of the amount of families going. So that was actually handled really well. Um, and there wasn't any like major traffic issues or anything. So I, I thought that was, you know, I just wanted to share that, that actually, everything seemed to work out that first day. So thank you for co helping and coordinating all that with everybody that put that together. Sally? Yes, uh, question. How is this uh, stars drawn testing um, compared to the NJSLA, uh, JSLEA? How is that compared? Like what's the two, I guess, how, why would there's two separate testing or how is it compared to each other? So the Start Strong assessment was something that was put into place just as a result of the school closure. Start Strong is to show where students were performing prior to the impact of the pandemic in the school closure. So their growth from the during the school closure. NJSLA is an ongoing assessment that has been given for many years. It has had a variety of names. Um, NJSLA, NJS, GEPA, so a variety of names, and that is to show students' growth over um, time. We typically don't compare cohorts of kids. We compare students to themselves and their academic growth. You're welcome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. If there isn't any other questions, then thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I'll turn over to uh, Ms. Stern for uh, BNF discussion items for tonight. Thank you. So um, I'm going to be pretty quickly turning it over to Mr. Sugars. We're going to, who's going to give us um, the most recent update on um, the bond referendum um, as our first item. Um, so take it away, Mrs. Sugars. Thank you, Mrs. Stern. Um, so this evening, <clears throat> this is actually gonna be a joint BNF and strategic planning update. Um, this evening, we do have uh, under our strategic planning section of the agenda, our resolution for approval of the bond referendum. Um, this resolution um, is, I guess, the official uh, uh, start off of the legal process that we need to follow in order to get the referendum approved. First portion of the resolution is an example of the proposal question that will be on the ballot. And I know that we get a lot of complaints about the wording. It's not always as user-friendly or clear as we would like it to be. 
unfortunately, we are kind of constrained by legal requirements. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, it's not always as clear as we would like it to be, but it does talk about when the polls will be open. Polls will be open on Thursday, October 6th from 6 a.m. until 8 p.m. Um, we will also have um, other methods of voting as well uh, for that time frame. Um, and then it, it dives right into the question itself and it talks about uh, the types of improvements that we are doing, um, some of the other funding that we are using in conjunction with the bond referendum. So it is not just um, bond referendum um, money that we are using. Um, it is also um, some money that we are using from uh, ESSER funds to supplement from the SDA um, and capital reserve funds that we're using as well. Um, so uh, you can see here, as you look at the bond proposal question, the different kinds of funding that we're using in conjunction with uh, the money that'll be raised through the bonds. Um, we also have debt service aid. The reason um, it does state that we're we will receive 40% because that is the state's um, uh, percentage on eligible costs. However, each year the state prorates that. They have a certain pot of money uh, that they allocate towards debt service aid. And so that 40% um, gets allocated amongst all the districts in the state that need uh, debt service aid. And so that 40% traditionally gets knocked down to 85%. Um, of the 40%. So the other issue is that not all of our projects <clears throat> are necessarily uh, eligible for state aid. Some of the projects that we are going to do will not be eligible for debt service aid. Um, and that's typically because of uh, new construction, which is at a much lesser rate than uh, the eligible costs are, or for projects such as athletic fields and things of that nature that just are not eligible for funding. And so at this point, the overall percentage that we're looking at is 31% of the total bond referendum uh, will be eligible for debt service aid. Um, and we are very excited to be um, moving on this resolution tonight and to um, start talking about and letting people know what's in the, what's, what are some of the projects that are part of the bond referendum and, um, you know, how we're going to be proceeding from here to roll out some of that information. There has been um, some concern, uh, as I understand it, about um, ADA projects. Um, and so we have this little graphic that we have put together um, so that people can take a look at it this evening. Um, in the process of trying to get to our debt capacity limit, as you may recall, when we originally started this process, uh, the amount of projects that we wanted to do exceeded the district's bet, uh, debt borrowing capacity. And therefore we needed to make a decision about whether we were going to um, go beyond our debt borrowing capacity or if we were gonna reduce the amount of projects that were in the program in order to stay under our debt uh, borrowing capacity. And the board made the decision that they would uh, reduce the number of projects. And so we embarked on that. Our first round of that, um, you know, we talked about removing the um, all-purpose rooms at the elementary schools. That was maybe not the most popular uh, choice uh, for cuts. And so we were charged with going back to the drawing board and looking at different things that we could cut out of the project to get below our borrowing capacity. And so one of the things that we did is we looked at what are projects that we have in the works, what are projects, what are things that we have done or are planning on doing between the time that Garrison Architects came in and did their evaluation and now, because annually each year, we budget a certain amount of money, either through the capital reserve or through our annual budget. And we have been doing projects. We have not been you know, sitting by waiting for the bond referendum. We have been moving forward with projects. And so when we um, decided what projects we could cut out to meet that limit, ADA, uh, there was a couple of ADA projects that we knew we could remove from the bond referendum because we already had funding set aside through the capital reserve account to do those projects. Um, 
And so I think at some point that may have been interpreted as we are removing ADA projects from the bond. That is absolutely not the case. Um, we look at this at a, as a wonderful opportunity to take a comprehensive look at our buildings to address ADA beyond the scope of what we've been able to address so far, to look at interior issues, to look at additional exterior issues that need to be addressed, and as a bonus to get funding from the state to help us um, uh, you know, tackle those projects and, and move them forward. Um, in the spring and summer of 2020, the board uh, contracted with Environmental Resolutions, um, who is the engineering firm that we work with, and we asked them to do a study of our buildings. We asked them to focus on ADA accessibility uh, as it pertains to the main entrances of the buildings. And so ERA came in and uh, over a time frame of about six months, did a very comprehensive uh, study of each building each of our school buildings. And those studies can be found on our website. Um, and so we asked them to focus on accessibility to the, to the main entrance. And we asked them to provide us with a list of the types of issues that needed to be addressed. Uh, in addition, we also asked them for a list of schools, the priority list by school. And that was based on the number of critical issues at each school uh, to help us as we move forward to um, address the ADA issues and to, um, in a very systematic way, and to make sure that um, it's something that we include each year as part of our budgeting process, as again, either set through the budget or through capital reserve funds. And so um, on that list, the top four schools on that list of the 19 were West, Woodcrest, Payne, and Lewis. West and Woodcrest, as you can see by our little graphic here, is work that we did in the 2021 school year. We spent $636,000 of our capital reserve dollars to address ADA accessibility at West and Woodcrest. In this school year, we are addressing Beck and Payne. Now, Beck is not in the top uh, on the top of the list. However, um, we had planned to do a security vestibule project at Beck that we did not move forward with, but we had the specs already done um, for the Beck school. We um, decided to move ahead with that project and also the Payne school. And if you drive past either of those schools, uh, you can see that that work is in full swing. I drove by uh, Payne yesterday and thought, oh my goodness, the steps are gone. Um, so that work is in full swing. We're spending $1.3 million at those schools to address ADA issues at those two schools. And in our 22-23 uh, budget, we budgeted funds to address um, both Lewis, which is this building here, which was number four on the list, and also Stockton, which is lower on the list, but Stockton has some additional paving issues there. The paving is, is literally disintegrating there. And so that one got moved up on the list. Um, to be addressed and those two items, we have budgeted $1.5 million to address those two schools uh, in the 22-23 school year. Part of the problem is that our um, budgeting process and our ability to put projects out to bid don't always coincide. So often we are um, you know, doing the work, like for instance, as I mentioned, we're doing Beck and Payne, that's actually, was budgeted in the 21-22 school year, but um, you know the, the work gets delayed until school is not in session, and therefore we move ahead with those projects in the during the following summer. So 22-23, that work will actually happen in the summer of 23, and that will be at Lewis and Stockton. Um, the next two on the list are Kilmer and Carusi. They are number five and six. And as we move forward, you know, hopefully with a successful bond referendum. Uh, we'll be able to tackle these projects um, in a more of an expanded way than we have been. We have been, um, you know, kind of picking um, items as we go each year through our budget process and budgeting according to the funds uh, that we have allocated. Um, and so moving forward, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity, opportunity for us to take a look at the needs and the issues and um, begin to address them, as I said, not only in the on the focus that we have had, which has been to the main entrance, but to look at the building as a whole and address um, ADA issues comprehensively at each of the buildings. 
So it absolutely is a priority for the board. It has been a priority for the board. Um, it has been a priority as we have gone through our budgeting process each year. And, um, you know, again, uh, it will absolutely be a priority as we move forward with the bond referendum. Dr. Malas, did you have anything that you wanted to add? No, I, I think that's pretty comprehensive, Ms. Sugars, uh, the way that you went through. Yeah, the, one of the big pieces that, that folks have asked about, you know, is um, just the time frame with it. And I, I think you went through to explain that. So we're challenged, right? Because the budget is adopted in April. Um, you know, and after the budget is adopted, it's difficult and virtually impossible to go out for bid to get substantive project work like what we're doing at, at Thomas Paine and at, at Beck this summer to be done in the same summer. And it's got to be done when school is not in session. Right. These are not projects that can be done in October or in November, right? So we're limited in terms of what that time frame looks like. Um, I love the graphic that you all came up with uh, and what it shows. It, I mean, it, it shows that, again, that growing, that ongoing developing commitment that the, that the district, that the board has made um, to addressing these projects, to addressing these needs. You know, it's why the board committed to doing the audit in the first place. We have some old buildings, right? Not, they, they weren't always well taken care of. We know that. I mean, it's why the, it's at the crux of the whole uh, discussion about the bond, you know, looking at the, the reality that, you know, the, uh, the, uh, ADA law was passed 32 years ago, right? Back in 1990. Um, there's lots of work that needs to be done within the school district. You know, over the course of the last five years, we've made this a focus and there's been an ongoing commitment. We continue to be committed to it. Um, you know, and, and I think that's something that, um, you know, the, the board takes incredibly seriously. It's something they certainly ask about and hold us to task to, you know, in, in terms of, of what goes on. But the work is progressing. We want the work to progress faster. That's why this these projects were taken out from the original bond discussion in January, because we can get them done. That, you know, the, the projects, Lewis, this building, the administration building, the alternative high school and Stockton Elementary School will be done next summer. If they were to be included in the referendum, they could be done at the earliest in the summer of 2024 or 25 or 26, depending upon where it is in the build cycle uh, with the rest of the projects. So this gets it done. The board has already committed these dollars, right? The next process is to go out for bid. The board will vote to award those bids. This is a board that is committed to making sure this happens, right? We have to go through those processes because that's the legal guidelines that we follow, but those monies are there. You can see the consistent and constant growth in the money that the district and the board have chosen to dedicate to getting these projects done. So um, thank you, uh, Mrs. Sugars and Dr. Mlash. Um, uh, we'll definitely go to questions. And I didn't see who had a hand up first, so but I'm I'm seeing pointing in this direction. So I'm thinking Mrs. Ms. Elmer Stratton, it might be you. <laughs> No, I was just trying to make sure I heard um, what Ms. Sugar said clearly. So we didn't cut anything that has to do with ADA, just to be clear. We did not cut anything that had to do with ADA. We removed it out of the bond referendum because we knew we had capital reserve dollars set aside over here. So we just moved it from one pot of money to another pot of money, but we did not, there's, there's still the commitment is still there to make sure that those projects get completed. Got it, 10,000%. And this graphic, where can that be found at? We just developed it today. Um, and so we will make sure that it gets um, distributed. We, we saved it. This is the launch of it. This is uh, the unveiling of it right now at the board. We wanted you all to see it first. Uh, so after tonight, you can be sure that uh, Mrs. Wilson, our communicator of the year, will be pushing it out uh, <laughs> widely and sharing it on all of our different platforms. <laughs> Okay, so again, I apologize. I don't know who had their hand up first. I'm just going to keep going around well, if that's okay. Wherever I, I don't care what. Uh, Mrs. Tong. Um, I just want to reiterate, I think, uh, is all the ADA and all the school building will be done using the capital reserve or somewhere from the bond? All from capital reserve, right? So, so just to clarify, if you look at the graphic, right, the work that is listed on the graphic, so there's work that's already in progress that, um, addresses the critical ADA needs of entrances to the building. Um, we did work last summer, we're doing work now, and the plan is, and we've discussed, to do the work next summer again, and that's all capital reserve money, okay? Um, and so the money that was set aside that was a year and a half ago in the bond, that's money that we have found another way to do the work and do it sooner. So it was simply to be fiscally responsible. We took that those items out of the bond vote because they don't need to be voted on. They're being done, right? They're in process. 
So just to clarify, does that answer your question? Okay, great. And, and I, I think I too, did, oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Sorry. Stone. That's okay. I just want to compliment that they are working on the back middle school. I saw the construction. I was driving by this afternoon to pick up my food for the <laughs> kids. So I was like, okay, they're working on something. Is that correct? Okay. So soon or in the next few years, we should complete all the ADA. So in the next. Well, I think that, I, I don't know that we can commit to that at this point. I think um, we have talked about the bond work probably being a five-year process. So I think probably five years is more realistic. And I think moving forward, you know, the board will probably have to make some decisions at budget time about, um, you know, do we, you know, timing of projects? Are there things that need to be addressed in a different way? You know, the advantage of doing them through the bond referendum funding is the 40% funding that we'll get from the state. And I think just to be clear, Mrs. Tong, you know, there are items in the bond referendum that are continue to be in there, many of them that are ADA related, like doors, right? Replacing doors and, and door handles to make sure that our doors are actually fully ADA compliant, right? I mean, we've never, if, if we don't replace the door, we don't, you know, it's, it's we, we can't get there in, in, in this work. So, I mean, there's a lot in the bond that, that speaks to this, but we, it was, as Dr. Malash said, and as Mrs. Sugar said, and we all know, this is a priority for, for us. We, it has been. And, you know, there's obviously a lot, hundreds of millions of dollars of need in this district. And we're taking capital reserves to make sure that we're getting these critical items, you know, some of them, and some, a lot of those dollars, we're getting them done um, sooner with capital reserves. So, but there's lots more because it is a top priority and it was a priority when the bond was developed. Thank you for that. Um, Mrs. Arroyo and then Dr. Rude. So uh, just a couple things. Um, a lot of the confusion and questions I believe came from the last or a couple meetings ago when it wasn't fully described. So I think um, moving forward, just to be a little bit more clear, while we may understand because we have conversations and, and discussions on it as a board, but when we're addressing and, and sharing that information with community to be a little bit more clear and transparent, again, the time frame is very helpful because I was confused about that um, as well and not understanding originally. While now we found the money in capital reserves, the concern was like, why couldn't we find that money before? And I know the bond alleviates a lot of that. And so we could we could say that because the bond has allowed us to then use those dollars for those other priority areas that we were probably having to pick and choose between all five priority areas. And I understand that. The, and But moving forward, we just have to do a better job at explaining and also justifying why those decisions were made in the first place because equity and access is important and our, our students need to be able and, and staff and administration, everybody need to be, needs to be able to access the buildings and even within the buildings. So um, I was confused for a lot of it. And, and you know, English is my second language and I had to reread 80, 85 times before I understood it. So thank you again, Sally, for asking. Um, but just again, more clarity. The time frame is super important, though, um, especially for those that are not familiar with the construction process, the bid process, and everything like that. So that's super helpful. But if we can continue to do that and provide that, I think that would alleviate a lot of the concerns that community may have had in the past. But I'm glad we're able to find the dollars to do this and that we can move forward and all these things are progressing. And then hopefully, when the bond passes, when, not if, um, that we'll be able to get all of this done. Yeah, Mrs. Arroyo, infographic, does that, is that kind of a good representation? Because I, I think, you know. So I'm not going to lie. It took me the minute to try to understand okay. what it said um, and what you were actually trying to show me until Ms. Sugars read it out to me, but I'm not going to have a Ms. Sugars reading it out to everybody in the community when they go open it up. So just a little bit more, maybe a, at the bottom, like why you're, do, like, what is this as description of would be helpful. Um, and um, it leads to, can I bring up the bond question now, or can I, so I have a question. It's just really confusing. It is a lot of words and I'm, I'm, it's overwhelming. Is that how bond questions look like? That's just a, a bit intense. And I can't see again. Uh, and, you know, I, it's been years, but, um, I don't know how well 
are you going to be able to, are we going to be able to describe the intensity of that question to community? Because it is, it, it's like, it could get confusing and I don't want that to deter people from voting in a positive way for it. I, I want to turn to the person who's more experienced with that question than I am and that would be Mrs. Sugars. Yeah, I mean, it's a consistent complaint. And uh, um, unfortunately, I'm sure Paul can help me out here too, that um, it's it's a lot of state required language that has to be within the question itself. And I believe there can be an interpretive statement yes, that goes with it. There can be an interpretive statement yeah, that, that clarifies it somewhat. Yes. So hopefully with that interpretive statement, we can help to make things more clear once that's on the ballot. Because the second half of the question has like a school and then zero dollars, a school and zero dollars. I'm glad you brought that up. I just want to explain. So it's zero dollars um, of of re, of um, that servicing money on those specific projects. So those are the things that are considered um, new construction. But I didn't get that from that. Is right. What I'm saying. Right. No. It is and you're and you're not the only board member who had that question. It was an important one. So. It's, it is very confusing, but I did want to clarify tonight for all of us that that zero dollars, it's not that there's zero dollars of projects in that building, it's just that those are not reimbursable by the 31% debt servicing, which is about a hundred and whatever. Yeah, and so my concern is that if I'm just going to vote because my neighbor said, go, go vote for this, and um and I'm like, oh, well, my school's on here and it says I have zero dollars, like my, I'm not going to vote for this if my school isn't getting money, like they're going to look at it that way. Um, I looked at it that way until I reread it. And then I had to have a conversation with somebody to clear it up for me. Again, I'm coming from a different angle, a different lens, like but I might be the only one. So I just, you know, throwing out how it confused me. I think it's a really important point. And I think we are going to, the interpretive question, since it's available to us, seems like it's a must have. So I think we have to work on that for sure. Right. And, and it's part of our responsibility as a school district after, you know, the, the board adopts the question tonight. So this is the legal ease that will be included on that ballot. Now, our responsibility between tonight, um, you know, and October the 6th is making sure that we're putting out information. We're putting out a, a individual page, you know, to explain what it means, what it says. This is what it means by individual schools. This is what it means across the district. You know, that it's from us as a district through, you know, I met with zone PTA leadership, you know, this morning through our PTAs, through people that are communicating in the district. We want to make sure that it is out there, that anybody that's got a question, it can be answered uh, and to be able to put information so that it's statically available, you know, whether it's mailed out to them, whether it's available on social media, well, it's a, whether it's available on a website, we'll have a dedicated website just to the bond referendum, you know, so that people can go right there. Uh, people can point folks there um, so they know where to find information. Uh, but that becomes our responsibility to make sure that everybody understands uh, exactly what it is, where the dollars are going, and what those projects look like for each of the individual schools. The legalese doesn't help us, you know, as, and I would say for the most part, you know, except probably for Mr. Sugars, the rest of us are all really lay people when it comes to these projects. Mr. Green is not a lay person when it comes to the language. This is his world, right? Uh, but the rest of us, you know, are lay people when it comes to this. And we need to make sure that we understand and that we can explain it to folks and that folks understand they can explain it to their neighbors and their friends. Uh, and the people talk about it. And so this is the simplest format it can be. Okay, just just double checking. As unsatisfactory as that is, it sounds <laughs> that's the case. Um, Dr. Rudin, then we'll go to Mrs. Fleischer, who's on on the line. So um, this is a fun game. So I wanted to play too um, <laughs> for a few clarifying questions. So there there are still many projects in the bond referendum that will address ADA issues. Is that correct? Yes. 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 Okay. Awesome. Uh, there are some projects that were removed from the bond referendum because we can do them better with other monies that we have. Is that correct? So, uh, so the issue really was that, you know, when you look at the process of developing the bond, which started over two years ago, there were okay. things that were put in there that subsequently we have prioritized and done through different funding sources. Right. So we were able to, as we were looking for things to cut out in terms of dollars, we were able to remove those items because we knew that we were doing them in a different fashion through capital reserve dollars or so, through the budget. So between the capital reserve dollars and the bond referendum projects, are there any ADA compliance issues that were in that survey that we are not addressing? 
not that I'm aware of. I mean, um, you know, we're, again, our focus has been on the main entrance and we'll be expanding that extensively to, as Mrs. Stern said, you know, doors and door handles and um, bathroom renovations and all those kinds of things that are even beyond the scope of what we have been focused on. Um, you know, can I guarantee you that every single thing will be ADA compliant at the end of five years of construction? You know, I think that um, anything that's renovated, yeah. anything, right, anything that's renovated will be, um, you know, again, as we stated, we have some old buildings and there, there are always going to be some issues, but I think that everything that we can possibly do um, will be addressed. I think that, um, again, as we have stated, it will definitely be a focus of the bond referendum work that's being done. So, so if I'm hearing, just to clarify, Dr. Reed, because I, I think that, um, the list that were, that these projects came from that's on the infographic. So they were on the critical list about entrance to the building, just right. to be clear, it was only external entrance to the building. So, but that survey, so from that survey, you, you have accounted for all of those projects and the bond referendum is going to go further and look at many more different compliance issues at the, at different schools. Yes. And in the future, anything that is not renovated, overlooked, that can be done in the future through other capital reserve projects. It can be. You know, when we get at, towards the end of spending the bond referendum dollars, we take a look around and say, well, you know, we need to address this or we need to address that. We have resources, you know, other resources that we can use to do that. So, okay. I, so I just wanted to to confirm and, you know, that like it, it sounds like every conceivable project that we have out there is being addressed and that's great. So thank you very much for confirming that for me. Dr. Root, I just want to say, because I think you know me as sometimes the the questioner, right? <laughs> questioning the questions um, in our, which you're not in the BNF meeting, but we had our committee meeting. We, one of the um, folks from uh, ERI who actually did the report was in our meeting and he actually, you know, as, as we're kind of, and I'm questioning and we're questioning, you know, about one of the renovation projects that was done recently at one of our schools um, about, you know, well, what about, you know, what if the, you know, we've heard sometimes ramps are poured and then they're off when they, when they cure, you know, so then they have to be torn out and redone, which by the way, is done at the cost of the, uh, the contractor, not to the district, right? Because that's not on us, that's on them. Um, but the, the story that was a little bit I guess, helpful for me in understanding is like how serious this is, how important this is that we get this right, get our ADA compliance, do it and get it right. Um, the company that was responsible, they pulled off a supervisor from a project on 295 to come and examine um, the grade of, of one of the pores. I, I think if I was the, the ramp or the pores, I, I don't, I'm at, at, to, to ensure that it was properly graded for compliance issues. And to me, I mean, you know, I guess we could look at it one way that was kind of obnoxious, maybe to, to pull them off to come look at one poor at our at our school district, but it was the priority to get it right. And that's the level of scrutiny that um, I think the company understands, ERI understands. This is why it's so important to get this right and get it right, you know, hopefully the first time. And if they didn't get it right the first time, the, that it's on the it's on the person who's doing the work to fix it at their cost. So um, just to give you a little understanding of that, because we talked about that. I want to go to Mrs. Fleischer because she's been quietly raising her hand online and then we'll go to. That's fair uh, enough. I'm sure by the, by the time we get through, uh, she, she finishes her questions, whatever I have to add will be wildly redundant, but you may not have to come back to me. Mrs. Fleischer. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, first, I wanted to thank Mrs. Sugars and her team for coming up with this. Um, and I agree with Mrs. Arroyo about a little bit more um, distinction about what this is, because I don't know if you want to put ADA somewhere on this or in other words so that people understand, because you really had to, I know what we're talking about, just as she had mentioned, and it just takes a second to really gather what, what you're going after. But it's a, it's a really great um, way to explain it once you understand exactly what you all are talking about. So thank you so much for that effort. And I definitely was one of the people that asked about the questioning for the bond. Um, so I understand that the legalese that we have to unfortunately 
you know, go within the, you know, within um, our boundaries um, is not working for us. And I'm very happy that we have what's um, called the interpretive statement. I was wondering what is our timeline for that and who will be writing that? And does that go through BNF or how does that work um, going forward? Well, I assume that our timeline would be, um, it would have to be done in time for the printing of the ballots. And um, Mr. Salamini will be writing that interpretive statement, not me, <laughs> um, you know, to help us, I'm sure with input from us, but uh, he will be the one that will be writing that statement. Okay, and then you're able to bring it either back to BNF or to the board just to over, uh, to look it over before we're able to put it onto the ballot? Yes. Okay, wonderful. All right, thank you so much. I'm all set. Okay, Mr. Mayor, do you have any more questions beyond Mrs. Fleischer's? Uh, it's mostly redundant as, as predicted. Just, uh, just one um, additional question about ongoing ADA work um, that's not already scheduled. Um, Ms. Sugars, you had, you had mentioned that we would, it sounds like we would have the opportunity in years uh, as we go into 2023, 2024, possibly to have some input on prioritization of bond money projects such that if there's an ADA project out there that we might be able to move up a little bit earlier, that's a discussion that we can all have, you know, given given all of the other competing issues and projects. Yes, we definitely can. I, I, I don't mind, I'll jump in just from a board perspective, that's our purview, right? And so, so we will, and I think, you know, obviously there's a lot of support for that. So for sure. Yeah, tremendous support. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, as we move into the planning phases of the bond referendum, there's going to be lots of different things to look at and co coordinating that work with other work that's being done as well will be critical, um, you know, and making sure that um, um, we can get more bang for our buck, you know, what kinds of contractors are out there, um, you know, who's bidding on the projects. Um, you know, do we do things by categories? Do we do all the HVAC work and have them work at several different sites? Do we each site do each site individually? Those are all questions that we'll we'll be grappling with as we move forward. Okay, Mr. Avadia, and then if others have more questions, we can go back around. Yeah, just a couple of things. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Stern. Um, a couple of things. I mean, one, I think you know. I think the board would have liked nothing more than to have delivered to the community 19 new schools. Uh, and this is something we examined maybe two years ago. The thing is, it's not fiscally possible. The reason that would be good in the context of this conversation is it would be 100% ADA compliant as all the construction will be. So $363 million of this bond will be ADA compliant. But at the same time, I think ADA is not something that gets finished. It's something that in a point of time you do, you know, but you constantly have to be diligent. And we have discussed at length as a board, you know, we've committed conceptually that we, we need to participate every year to this bond um, and the projects therein because the taxpayer cannot bear the full, the full burden of this. Um, however, it does free up some money. And where that really comes into play is if we don't have to patchwork this thing up every year and make the difficult decisions within this much cap reserve, and we can look at, all right, everything gets a bit of a new start and we can really be strategic. We can do some powerful things. Um, you know, the, I, I mean, I, many people have made the point, this really has to go through. It really, it's a head scratcher if it doesn't. Um, but I think for the, for the point of this, like for me, like there's definitely things I would do with the, you know, we can workshop this graphic. There are things that, I mean, yeah, they're just, they're, they're not, but look, we asked the team to do it. I appreciate this graphic. It's a great start of a conversation. That conversation's not over because all sorts of questions. I mean, well, the numbers, right? The school year numbers, they wouldn't, you know, they, they almost do us the disservice of the 2023 school year starts in 22, right? So we, yeah, so we need to, look, we need to, we need to work on all this. This is a nice, this is certainly a nice um, uh, palette to start looking at, but I think, you know, we're doing what's really responsible, but the base question really becomes, is what we've done in sc scrapping down the bond an upgrade or a downgrade to the ADA projects? From a time perspective, it can only be an upgrade. I'm correct in saying that, right? You know, this bond work will take five years. We're talking about money we committed last April 
and money we will be asked to commit, and the majority of the board comes back despite what will happen in election season, that will commit next April. There is no timeline for the bond that would get these projects done sooner than that. So I, I think that's the that's the piece is that to, to Mrs. Arroyo's point, the simplicity. This is an upgrade to what was removed. Um, and for me, that's very compelling. So for instance, people ask me, well, why don't you just do APRs instead of the ADA work? And I think, it, uh, you know, let me just posit a hypothesis. If the bond doesn't go through, I don't think we're doing any APRs, but the ADA work we must do. It's a commitment we must make. And I'll say as one of the senior members of the board, I've never met a board member for whom ADA wasn't in the top category. Never. I mean, I've, I've served with, you know, I think this is my third or fourth board. No, third. Well, that's my concern. Like, like it is our priority as members here as board changes and there has been a lot a big turnover in the past couple of years administration also has to have the same level of commitment that you see at this board right now right so i think that's just kind of some of the conversation that should be had as part of the transparency the time frame of all the work and everything because board turnover they could be a priority but the other priority could weigh heavier for them you know what i mean so it's just like um, and that's going to change, but if administration pushes ADA and, and supports that um, just as much or more than the board, that's helpful. And I just think to your point, you know, if the bond wouldn't pass, right, if that, because it's a vote, it's a vote, right, there's no guarantees of anything, um, then we go back to the drawing board to figure out the multitude of other projects that are ADA projects, you know, beyond the critical list, the stuff that you know, is important to get done, that we prioritize to get done. You know, capital reserves in the scheme of everything is is a good amount of money, but it's a small amount of money. It's not $400 million worth or $363 million worth. So, you know, it, we this is a commitment. And if we can, if this community can pass this bond, it accelerates all that work, all of the work, you know, interior, exterior, it's, it's powerful. I think it's also important to remember that there's lots of other work that's being done through the bond referendum that is critical as well. There's roofing, there's HVAC work, um, there's lots of other things that, um, you know, if it doesn't pass um, and we're looking at our limited capital reserve numbers, you know, we'll be competing for, you know, what do we do? How do we address, you know, the many, many issues that are going to need to be addressed? So I, any more comments, questions before we move on? So I'm, I'm going to, Mrs. Sugars, a little bit put you on the spot to see if you can give us any update about um, meals, free meals from, <laughs> sorry for the look, terrified look in your oh, eyes. No, that's what okay. if I was going to come out of Miriam's mouth? Um, <laughs> no, no, that's all right. Um, so we learned uh, last week, we got some information from the state. On June 25th, the federal government decided to extend uh, free meals for students over the summer. Um, I believe it's called Keep Kids Fed um, is the official name of the law. Um, and so we um, right now are planning on doing a meal distribution similar to what we did last year. Um, there are some caveats to that. Uh, we are no longer able to use plastic bags. So uh, people will have to use, bring their own bags, not only to the grocery store, but also to the food distribution. Uh, we're gonna kind of set it up as like a farmer's market type um, setup so that people can go through with their bags and, and pick the items. They'll have to take various items in order for the meals to qualify as a reimbursable meal. So they'll have to take the fruit, the vegetable, the protein, the dairy, et cetera. Um, but we will uh, ho host those distributions at East uh, on Wednesdays from 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock. Um, I know that we had two locations last year. Unfortunately, because of the lateness of um, passing this law, we are limited in staff, and we don't believe that we can staff two locations this year. Um, but we will try to make arrangements um, for people who you know, may have difficulty with access and getting access to the meals. Um, so uh, that's our plan right now. We're gonna start that distribution next Wednesday, the 20th. Um, and uh, you know, we, we are pleased to be able to extend this um, 
this uh, fee meals to our community for another summer. Um, it will end when school begins, unless the federal government decides to pass another law. Um, but uh, for now, uh, we can at least extend it through the summer. Mr. Chair, somebody just had two. Mrs. Wilson put out something this afternoon. Um, just a quick news uh, update went out uh, that has the information in there that people can refer to. Um, and it does go through August the 31st. If they're, uh, we'll put out probably tomorrow, if people we'll provide a number that they can call through to Aramark, if there is a hardship as you described, uh, or if there is a concern, um, we wanna make sure that we can provide as much as we can for as many families. Um, they do have to register the families they come up so they can check it off because they, that information has to be collected. Um, all children in the community, all children are eligible, right? Um, all children are eligible. Um, uh, three to three to eighteen in the community, and uh, till twenty one, if they are students in our district still uh, through twenty one, where we would have a uh, a number for them. Yes, three through eighteen, it does. Yep. Thank you for the update and for that information. And I think it, I think the piece about since we have one distribution site, knowing that if there are families in need um, and and that's a hardship, it's really helpful to know that there's you know the district will do what we can to work around that because it's a big it's a big town. Okay, it's a good discussion. I think we're done. Moving right back to Mr. Avadia. I uh, will go to Mrs. Elmore Stratton for uh, discussion items for HR. Thank you. Um, so HR committee, um, everyone knows that is not a, always much I can share. However, um, I will share that uh, we've been discussing uh, some new, uh, not new policies around the dress code, but some changes to the wording for the dress code policy um, that will be applied to certificated and non-certificated staff. Um, and, and some good changes, positive ones in us getting our wording up to standard and being uh, more cognizant of the changing times and making sure that our wording is appropriate for all communities. So that's one thing we discussed. Um, also, uh, as always, we're, we're in the process of filling our positions for the upcoming school year and we're, we're almost there in a good space. However, recruitment, recruitment, recruitment. So I, I will always have that as a running thing to share out from the HR committee that we are always looking to hire on new folks to join our district family. And maybe with that, uh, one of the things that we did uh, discuss is just we received an update on our new uh, proposed sub rates uh, for educational assistant, nurse, replacement, replacement teacher, um, sub teacher rates for the 2022 to 23 school year. Um, and one of the big things that I hope comes from this, and I think some of the other committee members would agree, is that this makes us more uh, competitive with some other places in terms of pay rates and um, openings and whatnot. So uh, look for that to be coming as well. Um, anything from Mrs. Stern or anyone that I'm missing? Mrs. Adrian? No. Any questions around anything? Awesome. That's all I got, Mr. Vadia. Right. So Mrs. Fleischer is now our PL chair. And so though remote, we'll ask her to move discussion items that way. Great, thank you, Mr. Avadia. Um, thanks everyone, and thanks for your actual patience tonight. Unfortunately, um, I'm home with COVID, so I appreciate uh, everyone's uh, patience with me here. And uh, so on with the PNL. Uh, I also want to thank um, Mrs. Friedel for having leadership up to this point, and I'm very excited to take it over and thanking Mr. Avadia, Dr. Malash, and Mrs. Wethington, who I'll be working with very closely to help us move um, anything forward with uh, PNL. So on the agenda tonight, we have um, a few things, uh, two things up for discussion. Um, I'm just gonna put it up and uh, the first one is uh, policy 0145, the board member resignation and removal revised. Um, this is something that we actually had spoken about before and we wanted to bring it to the table if there's any more discussion. It had changed the wording from, I don't know if everyone remembers from three action meetings um, that a, a board member would actually miss to three just meetings consecutively. 
that they would miss that would um, cause a possible removal. And when I say possible, if they, if the wording is not that, I could read the actual wording, but it is, um, we, in the, in the actual wording, it says that there uh, could be discussion within the board if there's extenuating circumstances. So it's not an automatic, um, that is already written into the policy. Um, so I wanted to ask Mrs. Wethington if there is anything else we needed to talk about with that before I open it up, if there's any other discussion with that. No, Mrs. Fleischer, you covered it. Okay, great, thank you. Does anyone have any questions or any additions to, um, to that policy that we were talking about? Okay, you're just gonna have to sort of yell it out or someone's gonna have to help me with this. <laughs> so if there was stuff, I won't be able to really see your hands. So um, I'll appreciate any help. Um, moving sure? to the next, oh, yes. It's Ms. Elmore Stratton. Yes, just, thank you. Can you just repeat the, the, you said three consec, that piece about the three consecutive. Right, the wording that we focused on is in, instead before it was three action meetings. And now the basis is that we spoke about is all of our meetings have action in them. So there's really no distinction between a regular meeting and an action meeting anymore when there used to be in, pre, in history of the Board of Ed. So we just changed the wording to three consecutive meetings instead of the three action meetings. But again, it's not an automatic someone is booted off because I think it needs to be you know, something that is not easily done. It says that, you know, due to, um, you know, unforeseen circumstances or, or it gives an out for somebody if there is a health issue or if there's something unforeseen happening, it's not an automatic, but we have those boundaries for this policy. Does that answer your question, Mrs. Stratton? No, that, that, makes, that makes total sense. I just was thinking, I know we had talked about like, if you're doing something for your job or something like that and, and how we would, all have the professional courtesy to communicate that ahead of time and everything to the group. So exactly, exactly. And a lot of these things that we're going to be talking about sort of layer on top of each other because we're going to be talking about electronic devices and we're going to, you know, a lot of these things are coming up and it's going to all play into that. But I think the basis of it is we it's not going to be an easy thing to remove a board member now or in the future. Um, for something that um, cannot be discussed within like at executive session or within the president and vice president or anything like that. So it's not gonna be an easy thing. Any other questions? You just have to shout it out if you have it. <laughs> um, I guess seeing none, I will go on to the next one, which is a bylaw 0167, the public participation in board meetings. This one, again, we spoke about previously also. Um, I don't know if you all talked about, uh, we, we spoke about the fact of possibly having a student comment section and we thought to bring it back to the board and Mrs. Wethington was gonna check um, with Mr. Green. And I was wondering, Mrs. Wethington, can you give an update? Because I know both you and Mr. Green spoke about this policy specifically. Sure, um, when I spoke to Mr. Green, he said that uh, most districts do not have a separate time identified in the policy. It's not, it's not necessary to change the policy, but if the board wanted to, um, it would be the first comment and they could distinguish a specific time. Did I get that correctly, Mr. Green? That's correct. Thank you for um, giving clarification. So so I, what I think is interesting is coming out of this is that really it gives the flexibility. It, by just keeping this policy as is, we don't specifically have to create a student comment section, but it also gives us the flexibility to put in the back of our minds, if we ever wanted to, we could do that on a case-by-case -case basis. So it, without having to change the policy. So it gives us that flexibility. So thank you for figuring that out, Mrs. Wethington and Ms., uh, Mr. Green. Um, does anyone have any discussion about that? Yeah, you have several. You've got Dr. Rood and Mr. Mayor, at least. Okay, Dr. Rood. Thanks. So, um, so I remember after after a recent board meeting where there was an awful lot of student um, comment, I talked to my uh, child, Aiden, and um, I said, okay, so what's the deal with this? Why, like with the public comment and students making comment? And this was their argument, which I think was very rational. Um, so student activities are after school and are often such that they have extreme like time sensitivity. So they might have a practice 
you know, I'm thinking of like hockey that practices late into the night and rink time is only at 7.30 or 8.30 or, you know, just examples of where they, you know, if if they can't give comment at a very, at a, if they don't know the specified time of when comment will be, it's extremely different, difficult for a lot of the students to make comment. They can't just sit around waiting for two hours until first public comment happens to happen on a night where there's a lot of agenda items. So while, while you know, I'm happy to just say, well, current policy is, is fine as well. I see a very valid argument from a student perspective of asking, can we please have a specific comment section at near the beginning of the meeting so that they have a very predictable period of time where they can know that they will be heard and um, they can plan their plan their everything else around that. Um, it's pretty hard for them to plan when uh, it could be anywhere within an hour and a half window. So I just wanted to share that thought with the board. Thank you, Dr. Rude, for that, um, you know, inclusion of um, into the conversation. And I think, you know, uh, and Mr. Mayor, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll um, call on you in one second, but just, I should have said this to begin with. Um, I think what we're gonna do is bring this back to um, PNL um, after the discussion tonight, we'll, we'll sort of, you know, mesh it out a little bit more and we can bring this back, um, you know, to talk about it. So, um, but thank you for that input, um, Dr. Rude. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes, um, so I'm gonna piggyback on uh, Dr. Rude's observations and input from um, from Eden. It's probably, um, students would have similar issues, not, not those that are tied to a particular schedule later with extracurriculars, but, you know, there's that homework thing and projects. Um, that with that occasionally parents get um, you know some requests to help with and those requests often come at 9 or 10 p.m. So we know a lot of our students, especially high school students, um, are working um, hard into the night on, on homework. So it does seem to me that giving them an opportunity um, when they know they'll they may have that opportunity if they if they wish to exercise to speak earlier um, on an issue of importance to them, I think would be would be uh, very helpful. Um, I do have a question though about about that. Regardless of how we end up um, landing on this, um, mm -hmm. would a student comment, if it is a dedicated student comment, or if we we leave it alone with flexibility, so students know that they can comment early, um, would that prevent students from speaking on all items, or would would an early comment still only have to be addressing an agenda item? Um, I, I can turn it over to Mr. Avadia, but from what I understand, it any comments at any time from any students can be about anything. Am I right, Mr. Avadia? Yeah, the student students are never limited by those rules. <clears throat> so whether they would to, in the current system, whether they participate in first public comment, second public comment, they don't have to identify an agenda item. We still do need their name in municipality, but other than that, it's a very liberal interpretation of of what it could be. Um, so, yeah, so I mean. I, I don't know where, I mean, so let me just, so Ms. Fleischer, so from a sure. policy perspective, I mean, I'm looking at the agenda tonight, right? So mm -hmm. what we know predictably is if this went, you know, is the suggestion, I guess, that that we're think kind of thinking about to do this, before, like after roll call, we would just go to a totally dedicated student comment. That could be interesting. That, that gives full predictability, but I guess to the other point that, um, those have made, I'm not sure that that's, you know, good timing for the students to begin with. So I, I, I don't, I don't know. It, the most predictable thing is to do it before we do any business in the meeting, but I don't know that that will, I don't know if the suggestion is to do three public or three public comments, one which would just be students. It's certainly worth, I don't know if we could get a sense from students that participate in board meetings, but I don't know. It seems like I don't know. I mean, for instance, tonight we could have just opened up and said, look, let's open and close a student comment. Nobody else could participate. Mm -hmm. They could talk about anything. And then you still have the second two where a student could still participate. That seems to be the most favorable to students because then whenever they pop in, you know, they sort of go to the you know the top and they, they have full reign all the way through. I don't know. I'm, I'm up into all this. Any other discussion? I just go ahead and start with my hand. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. Ovali, as you give the opportunity. Um, I want to also check in about the emails. Can the student email in in case they cannot meet at 6 30, the time a lot, or the whatever time after the first public comment, maybe second public, they're all busy the whole night? Can they do the email and then we can read it out on their behalf? So, so I would say so, so, so really two things. First of all, they could always email. So students could always email, but I think your question is really about, would we read it out? And I think our current system, Mrs. Sugar says no. Mm -hmm. Okay, so currently no, that is not the policy. Well, that would be a more Stratton. Sorry, hi, Ms. Fleischer. Um, so my, my question was gonna be in the longest of Ms. Tong of like, is there a way, and as opposed to us adding a piece of that, what can we utilize that we already have here? And I feel like, and and sorry to put one of our student reps on the spot if we mm -hmm. are putting you on the spot, but like, is there a way to make them more a part of that section by maybe if they, if students email to the student rep and the rep can read it and that be a, a special section or, and I see Paul saying no. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm just, I'm on the side of like, maybe they don't have to, be here or be online and it's just well, we're, we're just sorry to interrupt but um mrs stratton the one thing that we were very firm on right as a board is that we're going to keep um our meetings online when there are a lot of districts that are stopping that so the fact is they can call in so if we choose to have the student thing they can call in so it's not that we're um actually reducing the amount of time that they were actually we would give them three sections versus two sections really but I think what has happened is this year, specifically, we've had so many presentations that have taken up so much time at the beginning, it really has pushed them to like, it's 10 o'clock till we have the first comment section. So, um, but I, I think that we're lucky enough that they can call in. Um, but I think I, you know, I hear everybody and I think it deserves a little bit more discussion because I, I like hearing everybody's input on this. So I appreciate that, Mrs. Stratton, Mrs. Tong, thank you. Just Mrs. Fleischer, it's uh, Miriam. Yes, um, I, I'm not in favor of adding a third public comment section. I, I you know, I hate to say that, but you know, I, I'm absolutely in favor of student voice, and I, I really support the students having the full opportunity to speak on any topic at the first public comment. I think that's really important. These are our meetings, and we do our work here. And sometimes, I mean. Sometimes we're here till midnight, you know, it's, it's a long night sometimes. And I think to add a public comment, um, I, I don't know the solution. I really don't, but I, I don't know that it's too often that we don't get to, I, I think we usually get to public comment the first one within the first 45 minutes. And that's a long time in the life of a student for sure. In an evening, um, it's much shorter than it is for the rest of the community to wait sometimes. So I guess that's where I'm leaning if 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 we're putting that out there at this point. Um, and I, I think, you know, definitely, I mean, any community member can email us at any time. Um, and students probably should be, you know, more more regularly reminded that they have that option as well. Um, so I, absent that, I don't know, I don't really have another solution, but my thoughts. Thank, yeah, thank you for that input too, Mrs. Stern. I appreciate it. Um, is there, are there any other people that want, or any other board members that? Yes, we have, uh, Emily is going to tell us. Um, okay, great. Thanks, Emily. I just wanted to add, um, I, as a student personally, I don't even think adding a third public comment is the best solution. Um, and I know last time we discussed this, um, I think I was in favor of, giving more time for students to speak about certain topics. Um, but I realized that we, we have that first um, public comment that is open to students for any topic. Um, I just think a huge restriction with that is um, the fluctuation of the times and you don't really have a specific time. Um, as Mrs. Elmore Stratton said, um, Personally, as a board rep, I'd be more than happy to um, convey messages from other students at West. Um, I think that's a great idea because um, we're we're here to serve our community. Um, and in this 
in this day of an age with stress and anxiety running high, I know it's hard for like students either to get up here and speak in front of people um, or even just emailing. I know in the last year, um, it gets discouraging if you email a teacher and you don't necessarily hear back. Um, so it can get discouraging. So the other idea I had was possibly like, not necessarily emailing, but um, it's like, you know, on those websites where you put in a complaint, but it's not a complaint. And like you can put in a complaint and then they can contact you. So like one of those things, but you're not complaining. You're just listing what you wanna speak about and whether you wanna be, um, whether you want someone to reply to you or not. Um, so it kind of gives you that option so you can speak about it. If you want a response, you get a response. If you don't, you don't. Thank you, Emily. Um, is there anybody, Mr. Green, I don't know, because I, I apologize for not being there, but I heard that Mrs. Stratton said that you were nodding no to the email issue. That's, is that something that can't be done? Yeah, that, that would convert um, the student representative's report into a uh, an extension of public comment and um, the, the public comment needs to come directly from the public. Um, so there are certainly mechanisms we can talk about to try to maybe clarify the timing of that first public session, but uh, it would not be appropriate to, in a sense, turn the student representative report, which can certainly express student concerns as part of the report as a summary, but not into a direct essentially reading of, of student comments. Um, that's that's not the purpose of the, the the representative's report. Thank you, Mr. Green, and thank you, Mrs. Uh, Stratton, for bringing that up too. And Emily, thank you. Um, I think just hearing all the different um, thoughts on this topic, I think it would be good to bring it back to the committee, like I said, and and really have a, a more discussion and and feel free to get in touch with any of us uh, for anyone who has additional you know thoughts uh, about this, and then we can bring it back. Um, for a first reading, because it's just on discussion tonight. Am I right, Mrs. Uh, Wethington? Yes, you're correct. Okay. Does, does everyone feel okay with that? Is there any additional information you would like to present or questions that you have? I guess I'm seeing, I'm trying to look at the little Zoom okay. box, but I'm not seeing any, oh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, got a bunch of thumbs up. I have a ceremony. Thumbs up. Invisible, but. Okay. So, so that's what we will do. Um, we can bring that specific one back and have more of a discussion at our next um, meeting because, um, you know, soon we'll be back into the committee meeting. So it won't be a, um, you know, committee of the whole. So we'll make sure that's on the agenda. Um, moving, so is everyone okay for me moving down the agenda to the next um, first readings of the policies? Um, the first one is the bylaw 0155.1. It's the board member participation at board meetings using electronic devices. Um, so we had this as discussion before, it's now being brought up as first reading. Um, this is where we had decided that once a quarter, um, we could be online, just like I'm taking up my once a quarter tonight, if we okay it. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, it's that. And, um, and I think at, the only other thing we were talking about, if you're seeing the reading, the optional, um, part at the bottom about the board member not being able to uh, be included in an executive session if there is one. We want to take that part out is what I what I remember from our discussion. Um, so I didn't know if anyone else. So Mrs. Um, Wethington, I know that that uh, part we wanted to take out. Am I right? Um, yes, correct. For, and I okay, apologize. Perfect. We uploaded the wrong version. The correct oh, no problem. Has no problem. That <laughs> okay, so um, uh, that is the first um, thing. Um, are there any questions with that first reading? Um, the second one is policy 5111.2. It's the open enrollment. Um, this actually, the wording has um, actually changed to include that the Rosa Lottery is being phased out. And that is the biggest um, addition. A lot of these actually also, um, a lot of the policies are having to change the name of the buildings too. Um, between from Lewis and to Estelle Malberg child, early childhood education. So that is also coming up too. Um, and um, Mrs. Uh, Wethington, is there anything else specifically on that that I needed to mention? No, for open enrollment and attendance areas, the biggest changes are the Malberg name being revised. 
Okay, great. And then the second, the third one is 5512, harassment, intimidation, and bullying revised. This was a, a large discussion we had with Mrs. Weddington, who gave us all the updates on what state um, rules and mandates were being changed. Um, so this is um, the first reading of all those changes. Am I correct in saying that, Mrs. Weddington? Yep, you're correct. Okay, great. Um, the next one is policy 7410, maintenance and repair. Um, that was... Can you speak about that? Because it was adding specific, and I don't know if that was a state law per se, but it's adding that supervisors have to have specific certifications or, or things like that. I know that was in there. Yep, let me grab my summary. Give me one minute. No problem. So the summary, the summary says um, that it was rewritten to align it with with um, administrative code, and there's no substantive revisions to those sections that have been changed. Okay, perfect. Thank you, um, Mrs. Wellington. Um, the next one is policy eight one one zero, the attendance areas, um, and as Mrs. Wellington stated, um, the two main, you know, the main thing is about Rosa. Um, being trans, you know, not having the lottery anymore, and uh, where Beck, Carusi, and Rosa will receive uh, students from um, in 2023 and 24, and um, also how the students assigned to High School West are permitted to take German at High School East with transportation provided, as well as East students that are taking Italian at West High School, like both have transportation um, provided. Those are the, that's the policy changes right there. Um, and the next one is 8420, emergency and crisis situations. Um, that one um, is something again with the state and specific uh, specific changes that they had um, about any of the drills and the emergency drills that are going on in the schools about parent notification, about special needs and mental health um, being, making sure being looked at. There's a whole list in there that came from the state and that is included in there. Um, and policy 9320, the cooperation with law enforcement agencies. Again, this is something that um, the state uh, revised and is very important. Hence, uh, you know, everything is that is happening in the world. We're very lucky to have a great uh, communication with our state, but these are policy changes that came directly from the state that needed to be put into our policies. Um, are there any questions or Mrs. Wellington, do you have any additions? No, uh, I think you covered everything, Mrs. Fleischer. Jen, Thank I you so much. I appreciate that. Um, are there any questions or any more I did, discussion I did. about? So I'm um, going to, bless you, I'm um, going to the cooperation with law enforcement. These are yes. recommended changes. These are the ones they provided us to review. Yeah, so they um, align with changes to the MLA. And then the does it because there was also updated um, guidelines from the attorney general's office that revolves around um, engagement with young people with that with uh, marijuana and alcoholic beverages. Does that does that have to do like are you that has that should be kind of incorporated in here somehow? Because the like there was a lot of conversations earlier on in it were twenty twenty one with the prosecutor's office in the type of code of conduct that can be, or like charges and things that could happen if a young person brings something in because based on the directive, it's no longer something that young people can be charged with. Mrs. So, Oreo, I thought that we did that last year. Yeah. So, but that, this is- That policy. Isn't that what this is saying well, right here? Am I reading it wrong? This also um, updates the, the practice based on the, the changes to the MOA with law enforcement. Yeah, but the MOA is separate from the guidelines from the attorney general. That's a different directive. But those guidelines may not be codified. Okay. So we may not have updates on that based on where they are in the regulatory process. Okay. Great. I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mrs. Royal. And thank you, Mrs. Wethington, for making those clarifications. Um, Mrs. Fleischer, just a couple small things. Um, yes, Mrs. I, I probably 
probably fairly should direct this to Mrs. Weathington rather than you, but um, in attendance policy 8110 attendance areas, um, mm -hmm. I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, the last item E, um, James Johnson Elementary um, is, it's having them send two different sending schools oh. and, and that's shifting. We'll change that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you for, thank you for picking that up, Mrs. Stern. That was a good pickup, Mrs. Stern. Thank you. Uh, once in a while, if I read them all the way through. <laughs> um, and there's uh, another question I have on policy 5512 revised. Um, there's a mention of the school safety team, climate teams. Um, and I was just trying to recall if, if we get follow up on those findings in our, in our larger discussion that we've been having about um, just, you know, HIVs and stuff, I think. When the school climate teams do their work, do you know at the um, beginning of the year we'll be doing the HIV assessments? That's really their report out, quote unquote, on the work that they're doing. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Sure. That. Great. Thank you, Mrs. Stern. Thank you, Mrs. Webbington, again. <laughs> um, are there any other questions or discussion to have about any of the things that I presented? Um, I guess not, uh, as what I'm looking at. <laughs> so again, I appreciate everyone's uh, patience with me tonight online, and thank you so much. I'll hand it back over to you, Mr. Avadia. Thank you. Thank you. And so um, I know Mrs. Sugar said she was doing a combined report, but uh, Mrs. Tong, for, for strategic planning, anything you wanted to add referendum-wise? I, I, I might volunteer one thing because I, I know we as a board know that the date has changed. And I think there's a simple reason that the date changed is that the state of New Jersey told us the date changed. Um, I didn't want that to be confusing because we've talked, you know, people look at old board meetings um, and you will hear October 4th, but October 4th is, is not the day to go to the polls as of tonight. And so, you know, that's not a, that's not a, a conspiracy in Cherry Hill, but that's happened at our at our state level. So I just want to at least put that into the record. But is there anything else you wanted to kind of bring up? Let me do the whole side. Date to make sure everybody's aware of it, because I not a lot of people right now think of Tuesday as election day almost a, on the month. So I think we we'll have to publicize more often on that in the next few meetings. Yes, very true. All right. That will bring us, if I'm not mistaken, to our special action agenda. And I don't know how Mrs. Arroyo got the night off, but she did. So I will ask Ms. Stern to move the BNF agenda, please. Okay. Um, the superintendent recommends, and I uh, move the following. 18.1 approval of bill lists, 18.2 Resolu uh, resolution for the award of bids, 18.3 resolution for the award of transportation. And 18.4, action consent to approve business and facilities items 18.1 through 18.3. Do I have a second? Mr. Mayor, are there any questions? Mrs. Fleischer is being the... Okay, seeing none, Mrs. Sugars, you could please take the vote. Okay, board members, I have opened up the online voting. You may cast your votes. Mrs. Sugars, will that come to me even though I'm online? It should. Be, it should. Yeah, because I'm on, um, you know, that, where I'm supposed that'll to come leave, but it hasn't popped up yet. Yeah, Je uh, Mrs. Fleischer, that'll come in your board docs. It'll pop up. Oh, in the board docs. Thank on you. That screen. Yep. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'll be right there. <laughs> I see it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we have a unanimous yes vote. All right, thank you. And Mrs. Stratton, can you move the HR agenda, please? Oh, no. Okay. Um, the superintendent recommends, and I move the following, right? Okay. 19.1, termination of employment certificated. 19.2, termination of employment non-certificated. 19.3, appointment certificated. 19.4, 
appointments non-certificated 19.5, a salary assignment slash salary change certificated 19.6, assignment slash salary change non-certificated 19.7, athletic and co-curricular contracts 19.8, other compensation certificated. Um, any questions? Second, do I have a second? Mrs. Stern, any questions? This is Sugars. Okay, I've opened up the online voting. If there's any no votes or abstentions, you can let me know and I will note them. Um, Nineteen point five. No, everything else. Yes. Okay. Other than the um, actually, I um, I am also nineteen point five. That's a no from me, please. Are there any other exceptions? Okay, other than the exceptions noted, we have a unanimous yes vote. Okay, that'll move us back to Mrs. Fleischer to move the PL agenda, please. Thank you. The superintendent recommends, and I move the following 20.1 approval of harassment, intimidation, bullying, investigation decisions, 20.2 approval of harassment, intimidation, bullying, investigation, hearing decisions. 20.3, acceptance of board member resignation. Do I have a second? I don't see, um, Mr. Avadi, I think I saw your hand. Um, any questions? Jen, uh, I just wanna make a comment, um, just sure. to thank Kim for her leadership. Um, and I appreciate all the time that she spent working through PNL and all the other activities and helping us get the bond where we're at. Um, so thank you, Kim, if you're on, if you're not, uh, we appreciate your time here on the board. Thank you, Mrs. Arroyo. I agree with you full heartedly. Um, any other discussion or questions? Seeing no additional, Mrs. Sugars, can you please open the voting? Okay, the online voting is open. If there's any exceptions, abstentions or no votes, please let me know. Ms. Sugars, I have to abstain from 20.1. Oh, and maybe 20.2. Both of them, thank you. Ms. Sugars, are these in response? Uh, these are the HIVs from the end of June. June. Okay, yeah. so I'm gonna, uh, let me see, I'll do my vote since there's other things. So I have to abstain from 20.1 and 20.2 because I was not at that meeting. Okay. It's announcing. Sorry. Mr. Speaker, I'm gonna abstain 20.2. Thank you. Okay, other than the exception center, we have a unanimous yes vote. All right, thank you. Um, and then we'll go with uh, Mrs. Tong. Can you move strategic planning, please? Your speaker. I keep forgetting about this one. Sorry. Um, the superintendent recommend I move the following: twenty-one point one resolution of the board of education of the township of the Cherry Hill in the Camden, in the county of Camden, New Jersey, authorizing the submission of a bond proposal questions to the school district voter at a special school district election to be held on October 6, 2022. 21.2, uh, action consent to approve strategic planning item 21.1. Do I have a second? Hmm, it's so funny. <laughs> Are there any questions? 
no, no, I think not, Mrs. Schippers. Okay, board members, I've opened up the online voting. You may cast your votes. And we have a unanimous yes vote. Mrs. Um, Sugars, I apologize on the previous, um, the HIVs for the 628, and I have to find exactly what it is. I need to abstain from that. I realized I was not there, so I apologize. Um, twenty point one and twenty point two. Exactly. Thank you. All right. So usually Dr. Malash does this, but people ask sometimes in the community when we will have a bond or when when we can say we have a bond. And as of about two minutes ago, we could say that. So congratulations. Now, new business. Would anyone like to bring new business this evening from the board? Okay, if not, we will turn to old business, um, which will Thank be you. a nice discussion that I will, uh, I'll turn over to Ms. Stern. I'm gonna take a, a bit of a, just a moment, moment for a bio break, but I will join you again. But Ms. Stern, take it away, oh, district but, goals. Ben, before we get into that, cause I know this is gonna yes. be a long, a, de a decent conversation. Can I add, can I add, bring up an old business before we get into this one? Oh, sure. Um, just a quick uh, ask if Dr. Mahan, um, I know we've talked in the past quickly about the family life curriculum. I, if you could just share if any, there are updates, if there are any updates um, or where we're at in that process. Yes, I can. Actually today I had an opportunity to meet with the two teachers who will be working with me to revise the elementary family life curriculum based on the new health and physical education updates. Our meeting was overwhelmingly positive. And after taking a deep dive into the standards, um, as many of you are aware, there are really three that seem to be somewhat controversial at this point. Two of those standards apply to the K-5 curriculum. One is related to teaching students about um, puberty, hormones, relationships, et cetera. Many of those topics are already covered at our parent um, boy or parent girl information nights where we already cover puberty, relationships, hormones, deodorant, all sorts of things about the changing uh, adolescent body. So we feel like that will be a nice, easy fit into our curriculum. We are looking to build consistency across the presentations that are shared at the 12 elementary schools. The other item related to gender identity and teaching students about, I want to get the language correct, teaching students about gender roles, um, that there are no gender, gender conforming roles, speaking to students can have access to any types of jobs, they can wear any colors that they want, um, they can dress the way that they would like to. So that is the way the language in the new standards is written. That topic will be a little bit more difficult for us to align with because we are going to be speaking in regards to gender identity. So um, we have some consultants that we will be working with to make sure that our language is appropriate, developmentally appropriate for our students, um, speaks to the intent um, in which the standard was written. We intend to have a presentation to the CNI committee of the board on August 2nd so that the information can be shared any changes that we make will also be available in Rubicon Atlas, but we will provide more detailed information after we've had a chance to go through everything. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. All right. Since Mrs. Arroyo has broken the seal on uh, old business before we get to district goals, we are, now that we've accepted uh, Ms. Friedel, who was a wonderful leader uh, and colleague here on the board, um, we are in search for a new ninth member. Um, 
and that and i just want to go over the timeline so by the 28th at 4 p.m i believe oh well, here we are no nice nice graphic by the by the 18th at 4 p.m anyone who is interested um, must indicate so and email in uh we will we will get that as a board that uh later that day we will bring that to discussion in an executive session before our cni retreat on july 20th uh our intent is to notify applicants the 21st and then on the 26th we will have um the panel candidate forum format um for the finalists um our hope if uh, background checks go the way we'd like them to go uh, is that that board member could be seated August 9th. So we have we have received quite a bit of interest, but we are if you are interested, we are interested in hearing from you. And um, yeah, that process will uh, make a lot of headway this month. So just wanted to add that. And with that, assuming there's no other, no, no okay. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Ms. Stern to get us started on um, district goals discussion. And I guess, you know, if you could take us through kind of what you did with your, the subcommittee and where we are and, and what we need to talk about tonight. Thank you. So um, I think, you know, every year this has been an evolving process for our board. Um, as we all know, we are a very young board in the in our in years of experience. So this is kind of an evolving process. Um, so this year, uh, the district goals, um, we started the process with uh, Dr. Malash and his team sending us a copy of, updated copy of the goals from this past school year and uh, putting in some revisions um, and edits and updates, and then sent that to us. We took a look at it. We had our, our uh, public meeting with our goals discussion where we laid out um, our the board's, you know, input into where we want to focus our attention and um, and what goals we want to work on and how we want to do it. And then we took that information and met in as a small group um, with uh, Mrs. Fleischer, with Dr. Rude and Ms. Mayer and myself, Mr. Mayer, Ms. Mayer, Mr. Mayer. <laughs> it's done to with that person over there in the plaid shirt. Um, and, uh, we began our picking apart and adding in and changing, um, and it was, you know, a good amount of work and effort put into it, um, collaboratively and worked together with Dr. Malash and his team. Um, and, and they worked on it and we worked on it and a lot of back and forth and some good meetings. Um, and we somehow navigated through that despite graduations um, sicknesses, vacations, et cetera. Um, and we've come to this um, first draft product. I, I do want to say um, one of the conclusions we all came to is that um, a, as this process is improving, um, a better improvement for next year will be to sit down together rather than work in kind of like board group, administrative group, but next year, I think all together from, from the start rather than back and forth. Um, and what you see is the final project, um, uh, sorry, final product, first draft. So this is the opportunity I really want to ask, um, both kind of from a, a, a ten thousand foot view, big picture perspective. You know, is this capturing accurately what um, you know all the board members, uh, the input that everyone has given um, for where we're at? Obviously, some of these goals are continuation of goals from last year. There's, I don't know that it's very easy to accomplish a singular um, major activity necessarily in a school year, especially in a year where we were trying to come out of COVID. Um, so, but I think first of all, big picture, do we capture all the items and then we can kind of drill down a little bit. So um, this is Arroyo. So um, in terms of the process, I preferred how we did it last year when we all engaged in it versus the way it was like coordinated this year, just saying, cause I, you know, we were all in like, it, like intimately involved in the conversation and finalized as a group, the goals. So this year it kind of seems scattered and I didn't, I don't, you know, it just, as me as a, I just don't work that way. Um, and I felt lost throughout this process. So that's just in terms of the way you coordinated it this year. 
Um, I also, um, the goals from what I, because I missed the um, the goal, the original meeting, I, I think I, I had COVID at the time. Um, the, I didn't really get um, changing goals every year is difficult because we were still trying to measure the ones we did last year. So um, if it's like, and I have to fully go through all this because when I, you know, once I got the updated document, I didn't have too much time to review before this evening. So I'm going to, I still have more time to review and make sure. But um, if we have a five-year plan and the goals that we update every year um, did, and again, I wasn't part of the process. So did you guys review the outcomes and then move them forward for the goals for this year um, that you're adding into it? So it's a good question. Um, and I think you'll see when you do review it, there actually is a lot that has remained in um, that's a continuation. So it's like we did the first step of the work this year and we're doing the next step. So yeah, if, if actually, if you take a look, um, actually number two, for example, um, promote shared ethical and performance uh, values visibly and comprehensively through district cultural proficiency, equity and character education work CPs. So that's a continuation. Um, and then the indicators of success you can see on there, um, revised student code of conduct. So we've been talking about that this year. So that, that's yeah, now so on Yeah, so I'm going to, before yeah. you keep going, um, because just yeah. so I can process this, sure. because so if I'm updating the goals this year, I need to see the outcomes from last year attached in this chart to show me that the next indicators of success are meaningful and still follow that trajectory for how you manage to get to this point. So if you take if you take a look and you don't have to do this at the moment, but that's part of the feedback when we sent it out last week to kind of get the feedback, you know, and and this is an ongoing discussion that was the first kind of go around of the of the final first draft. I don't know, I'm going to say it, but um if you have suggestions for that, you know, I think we worked to capture that, but if there, if there's something that you'd like additionally or differently, this is absolutely the opportunity to do that. So what I'm seeing here is next is next, this coming year's goals, right? That's what I'm seeing. It doesn't, but the one, the part I'm asking for is the results from this year's to go in between to show that the trajectory is the same because you're adding additional things that say, okay, we did this, but then here's the extension of this. Like, you're, you know what I mean? Like, I don't see the flow of that. When you look for anticipated impact, you need to see where you started to where you're going. And, and, and just so looking at the development of the goals, that's what I'm trying to see. Like, it's kind of hard for me to, I'm looking at the old ones and I'm on online and I'm looking at these and I don't see like how you got to this point. You know what I mean? And again, I wasn't part of like, the conversations and, and everything. And if I've missed something, I'll totally own that, but just in terms of process wise. Yeah. No, uh, I'm just, I'm just jumping in for a second. Um, so I think, I think it's good feedback, right? So there is a piece here too. We had these fully flushed out goals last year. What happened? It, some of this gets a little chaotic, but I, I just want to make sure. So when we're talking about it today, it's no one's asking to approve these goals. We're circling back to the board to just say, as you see this. Now, I see what you're saying. You're saying there's a piece missing. And so we're really, our timeline got a little bit, we lost a couple of weeks here, but we're going to ask administration to kind of help us through that. There is a piece missing. I hear what you're saying. And I think, I think that's right. Um, however, today is a critical, important just to look at this and to say, you know, as we do this, how can we engage the full board? To me, looking at the process last year, because I was intimately engaged on the, on the other side of the process, once Miriam and I brought it, to the board, I didn't feel like we had enough time to bake it to something else. So we ended up really approving what our little subcommittee worked on. I didn't like that. So we really want to engage the full board again. I think that's the intent, right? It is. It is. And I think, um, you know, I think you're asking for very specifics and it, you know, to point out without going through all of them, even a number, if you look at number three. So last year, there was a, a goal to meet with the families of special kids with special needs and assess, and ha we had those 20 meetings, right? So the continuation this year says presentation to CNI committee in August of the analysis of the meetings with the parents of children with special needs, identifying impact changes and next steps for implementation. So that's, I think, I don't know if that's what you're talking about, that level of like that, what's that next step in the process? It, it, it references the previous goals and then moves on to the next step with it to give us where are we going with this? And that was 
that's what we worked on. I think for me though, because I this is what I do every single day. You had like the missing, like this chart is missing pieces. So that's what I'm saying. This chart, like you adding it in in the indicators of success. Like last year we did this. No, no, no. That 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 work was really hard work that this district did that deserves its own space that in that shows the process that occurred. So that then you can expand on the trajectory moving forward. That's you like goal, proper goals and outcome processes incorporate that that piece. Like that's a major part of moving forward. And that's just looking at it and, and trying to like go over it and matching it up to the old ones. That's all I'm saying. Just in terms of the board's committee work that did that, that. And again, I wasn't involved. So I think. Can I just add real quick to the, so just one other piece, the, the finalization uh, and the review of the success of achieving the goals is also done as through the evaluation process that you all do on me. You know, that's the information that we put together, uh, goes through the administrative team, works with the buildings. Uh, we put all the information together. It's submitted in the document form. Uh, then the board has to go through and make a determination. You know, uh, did we make satisfactory progress? Was the goal achieved? Um, you know, or unsatisfactory progress? the backup, the, the different things that are in the folders, like that's that that finalization of, of the one year's goals. Ms. Elmar Stratton. I was just gonna add that same thing. I, so my assumption was that when we had that presentation, we reviewed, we heard what the updates were and then in Joe's um, eval, we heard where the updates were, but I see what you're saying. You're looking for more of an outcomes results chart. And I don't think this is what this is. I think this was us mapping out where to go next. And so that's why it's looking weird to you because you're used to looking at logic models that are continuous documents. And I don't think they. Do I'm not it sure like it shouldn't be though, because. No, I agree. Like, I, I also think it's unfair while I have, I have very high expectations of this district and of myself and of us, like you, we can't keep doing that to change dramatically not saying you did, but we, you know, that that's, that's a lot to ask that like, you want to make sure it's, it flows, it makes sense. You know, I we're and that, so that's why that is important when we have, that was, that was what was missing last year. And I'm just saying that again, we're missing it this year because that presentation is not the presentation that's in front of me. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. I think it's in our definition of, I'm saying our, but in our work-life definition of logic models and action plans, that piece is there as a checks and balances, especially if you're presenting it out to other stakeholders. And I think the definition of action plan here is a little bit different. And I think that might be what's throwing you off a little bit. So Just, it, and, and not saying you're wrong, because obviously this is your job 90 nine percent of your day <laughs> but i think it's just a wording thing that we're what we're used to looking at is not what they're used to looking at but to your point maybe we need to evolve to that so that we can be more uh efficient in planning dr reed sorry that's that's okay i just i want to make sure i'm not cutting people off um, so sitting on the goals committee, I feel, you know, I'm taking a look at this. And so looking at our district goals from last year, we, we have the same major categories in this document. So it's, it's the same categories, but I, I completely, well, I won't say completely. I have no idea what your logic models are. I would love to learn what that, what that process is. Cause it sounds great. Um, and I think that having some sort of like I, I've com not complained, but commented on like how information and data are shared at different board meetings for, for different things. And this is an excellent case where the board is working on a product and we need to make sure that our high level of expectation of display and relating things um, is there. And and I I think, Rosie, the idea of having, you know, what what were our indicators of success last year and how do those map on map on to what we're doing this year like what did we accomplish what has carried over and being able to visually look at that in a chart like trying to print this chart out on paper with another table with another table column won't work but but we could definitely do a, I think uh, having a separate table that specifically looks at what you're talking about and make would make a lot of sense to be able to look from like, what did we try to do last year? What progress did we make? Why did we make changes this year to the to the goals? And what's 
like what's different. I think that's really an ex excellent way to look at it. And as part of the committee, if I can volunteer myself to to help, um, if you guys would be willing to talk more about what it is you're talking about with your logic models, I would love to see if I can help uh, our group that's been working on this bring that product back to the board if if I'm not overstepping yeah. there. Um, I'd love to, because I think that uh, it's actually a really important point. We'll start printing everything on like, you know, those big like drawing pads. No, bigger than legal size. I, I think that would be really helpful. And I think we want to make sure, um, you know, that we're getting kind of capturing the essence of what you're looking for, Rosie, which, which also makes a lot of sense to me and making sure because we can do that this year. There's this is this is the discovery first and you that's a 10,000 foot view. You know, it's just great feedback. Yeah, it's so. just Jesse had outlined it really well last year in terms of like, how do you do this as a board? You have this five-year strategic plan. Then like, then you take your measurements from this year and then you incorporate it into your movement for next year. Like, I, it, how, we can't miss that after we just had that training and full length discussion with him last year. Like, it's just, you know, that's weird. So, I so I guess, so, so I think if you're comfortable, Dr. Rude taking that on, that's, yeah, if it's and, okay as part I of. I just want to make sure you know what's being asked, or that. So I don't want you to do the work. Yeah, let me not... let me try to try to be clear about what I'm offering, for this committee, to do. What I would like to do is take what what we've done in our in our uh, separate uh, goals committee already. I will take that around to different members of the board, have conversations yeah. about how we can improve uh, the format, especially with looking from what we did last year to what we did, did this year. Um, so I'll be honest, Rosie, I don't 100% know what it is you're asking for. But what I want to say that I feel committed to making this a good process. And, and clearly, like, I thought that this was something the board's been doing forever. And then Miriam's like, no, we, this is our first time last year. And I'm like, oh, no wonder this is so complicated and difficult. And we're struggling and bouncing around. This is this is a, a kind of a new process. Um, for everybody, um, and uh, we're figuring it out, I think. Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, well, the board's always had goals. Like, but the, but, but, but right, the doing it this utilize, well, yes. Yeah, Our process is changing drastically, I think. Um, and I, I would like, so I would like to talk with you guys and figure out what it is you want to see in this plan so that when we present it to you, you are feel that the information, the, the questions you have are answered. And basically that's what what I'm offering to do. So I'm offering to make another table. I like tables. It's gonna be a chart, a pivot chart with it and all that stuff. <laughs> Scatter plots, come on. Bring all your tools <laughs> to this, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'll just, um... As long as no actual tools, especially power tools, are involved, I mean, th th this is important. That's a that's a great um, uh, suggestion uh, that Ms. Royal has, and and Dr. Root shouldn't have to take that on himself. So, um, you know, let's figure this out. We'll do this together. Um, and I think it also goes a long way towards you taking a thirty thousand foot view, right? We we want to be um, we want to be able to be a little more transparent um, with communication. And, and and if the chart as it as it is now doesn't quite get there, um, then um, and, and if it's really historical look back to last year, where are we? Where what did we hit? What didn't we quite hit? If we didn't, why didn't we? And what and what have we put in here to address that? Um, if if that goes a long way towards solving that, then you know it's all good. So uh, you know happy to happy to take another shot at that. Um, Mrs. Stern, I just wanted to, uh, as the third member of the committee, I'm not going to be left out here. <laughs> of course, I'm going to help uh, Mr. Mayor and Dr. Rood um, with whatever needs to be done. I think our committee is willing and able and ready um, to take on whatever, you know, is going to be the easiest thing. Um, and I also just wanted to step out and and just say that one of the things that I had spoken about and we had talked about is the overall arching idea of, like, Specifically, we're looking at trying to get these for next year. 
But I think going forward, not realizing, because the three of us were new, like Dr. Rude, Mr. Mayor, and myself, um, knowing that this actually is a new thing, like what Mr. Avadia said, that you first had really done so much work on it last year for really the first time in a long time, that maybe putting more of a structure that, you know, whatever we do should maybe be, you know, in place for like four years. And then at each year, sort of look at, you know, the strengths and weaknesses and where we could tweak things and then a major overhaul starting on year four or something like that. I would love to look into creating a structure like that so that each year when we go into this, it doesn't need to be sort of rewritten as much as we have put a lot of effort into this. And I think there's new information coming in, but I just, I also uh, want to make the goals uh, reaching, but actually doable. So I know I like your idea about having the administration really start with us from the beginning next time so that we can really have more of a back and forth. Um, but I'm willing to do any work with Mr. Mayor and Dr. Rude too. So thank you guys. Mr. Avadia. Okay, oh, thanks. Um, all right, no, all, um, all good stuff. I, I want to say a couple things. One, we can't ignore, I mean, the, the board is, is great and we're an important institution, but th this, this work really and where we are even now, we, we've got to do this in partnership with the administration. Um, I think anything we do from this point, I mean, I'm happy to extend the timeline, right? Because we talked about July, it doesn't sound like that's going to happen. So let's say we, we go into August. Um, we got to have administration at the table. They know what they did in the last year. They know how these goals fit the other goals. Um, they're actually, they're not necessarily as different as you might think, but there is a piece of information here that's a work product that will not be printed next year on every bulletin board in every school that we need to see. I get that, yes. But we, we need to engage Dr. Malash and, and through Dr. Malash's team to really help us. I, I don't think we're going to bake this without them, you know, in, in a productive way. Um, the other thing, obviously, is, you know, you're, you're a non-quorum group, um, so you can't all engage individual board members, but splitting up that work definitely makes sense. Now, for me, looking at these, on number one, I think student wellness is important. I think that, you know, we have adults as well. I think their wellness directly correlates to student wellness. For me, I'd like to see some definition in terms of what's SEL curriculum, what's our instruction, and what's our policies. We're in COVID. It's been a tough time, those times, and that, you know, th that that piece of of you know becoming whole, that's not going away. So we 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 spend more time as a board thinking about SEL. I think that's got to be flushed out here. Um, I like that CP is called that. We talk about it. I think that we at some point have to identify as a board what is CP doing and how do we support that work and yet perhaps do additional work um, within that lens. Um, when we're talking about town hall listening sessions, if I'm reading this right, I understand the getting 20 meetings uh, with ELL, you know, Latinx, get, get the perspective. Town hall, I'd want to understand what we're talking about, because I don't recall doing a town hall like this. Uh, and if we're talking about having a town hall with students and understanding that, I could understand it. If we're not, I definitely want clarification. I think when I look at start times, I think we've had a lot of discussion in the community that we are not ready to pull a trigger. We are not ready to say, this is a direction we're totally moving. What we, I think, owe the community as a board is to uncover every aspect of the issue and create a plan in case one of two things happens. One, the state says, you're doing this. Every district's doing it and figure out a way. We should have that plan baked. It's clear, there's clearly advantages. It's clearly complex, right? We got to think about every student and are they working a job or do they have, you know, uh, child care responsibility? You know, where are they? What are, you know, how can we look at a, a full plan? But I wouldn't want the goal as we sit today to assume that we are moving forward. I, I just, I don't think we're there. I think there's, there's just work that should be done, but I think that should be sketched out. Student achievement should always be a top priority. I think thinking about how we use more of these district assessments, we talked today about Start Strong. We talked about NJSLA. We do district assessments on a very regular basis. One of the biggest things I think for us is grades. Yes, they're subjective, but they are a measure of how our students are doing. Uh, we always, I think, need to, to, so more granularity, more presentations to the board. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've heard that in the community, but I, I believe it as well. I mean, the more we study student achievement, it is why we're here. 
Um, it, it is a top goal, or it's one of the reasons we're here. Um, okay, this looks good. Do, do, do. Sustainability plan. Now, this is brand new. I like that this is scaffolded as figuring out what it takes kind of thing, not that we'll have. Well, I, I, think, I think one of the things when you look at goals, we've got to go on a journey. We don't know where that journey will end. Should we be more sustainable? Yes. Should we be greener? Of course. What does that look like? That's something we have not put the work into. We should. We can leave that as a board. We can, we can do that stuff. There is a certification NJSBA offers called green something or other. We should send someone from our team to, to go there. You know, let's, let's look at what the leaders are doing. Um, but I, I think, you know, so that's where it is. I will say for redistricting, I don't think that relates to school start times, does it? Uh, I'm now on page, first page of Connecting Beyond Our Classrooms. I think that may be a carryover of something. No, so the school start times is a separate, is a separate item. Right. Okay. So that, so that should, should probably come out. Um, world-class experiences. Well, I think. But, um, Mr. Avadi, the reason this is in here is because we haven't completed the work of the elementary school redistricting. Redistricting. That's why that. Mm -hmm. But the school start times. Oh, oh, oh yeah. No, that doesn't belong. Thank okay. you. So it's a carry. Okay. I'm, I'm with you. And then I think world-class experiences, you know, people, people know that I, I like uh, strategic vision goal number three, happy to see it in there. Um, so that's, that's some of my commentary, but thank you to the committee who I think worked very hard uh, to get us here. We could always improve the process and, and frankly, we should. So, okay. Thank ben, you. Ben, you brought up something that, so I'm not vulnerable and you're labeling me as a Latina vulnerable in this conversation right here at the whole three town hall meetings, listening sessions with Latinx families to assess specific needs of this vulnerable population. I'm actually, that's actually really offensive. I think in general, no, it's, I'm, it's just not. No, that's not what I was going to say. What I was going to say is I, I think the town hall um, piece makes sense to have in general, a open discussion town hall with the students. I'm not sure, as Ben said, if it makes sense to have three meetings, town hall of families, that, that's not clear to me. So um, I don't, I'm, I'm happy to remove the entire piece and, and focus on student town halls with those, that population end of story. But I don't know what, other people think about that. I think definitely talking to your CPs committee and um, Dr. Mahan and some of maybe the teachers that work with our, with just some of the teachers in the in the schools, get some feedback from them. But yeah, that just I honestly don't even want to see that anymore. That kind of is like super ridiculous that language. Mr. Arroyo, so I'm, let's remove that wording. And can you educate us on what, if you if you kind of understand what what was trying to be said there, could you share the appropriate wording that's not offensive so that we don't make that mistake? You're forward? just saying that you want to have more conversations with Latino community, like that's it, like just to get a better idea from their lens. You're not like adding vulnerable, like you're. Like, you know, that's we have some high power movers here in this in this township that are Latinos. Like, what are you what are you saying? So that's just, you know, throwing it out there. No, that's we need the education and it needs to be on all levels. So if that's not appropriate at the board level, let's clear it, take it off and let's not have that moving forward. And thank you for sharing that and saying that and calling it out on us. And apologies I can't make apologies on everybody's behalf, but apologies for any communities that are upset by that wording as you're upset. Other input feedback, whether at a high level or a specific level, Emily? I absolutely agree that student achievement should be a top priority. Um, but I think on that same level, mental health should be up there because a lot of the times the two are connected and if your mental health is good, usually you'll do good. And if not, it doesn't always go well unless, and sometimes you just can't see what's going on. Um, and someone's just pushing their limits to get to where they are. Um, 
So I think um, more, there should be um, more with SEL. Um, I know it wasn't really like strictly followed during COVID and when we implemented it, but I think it's extremely important. So um, Emily, it's in major activities, the first one, um, it's it's called out there. Would it, Would you want to add in, I'm trying to think of how to capture student voice for like further student voice as as input um, because I think that that I mean that's not clearly delineated here so is that I mean am I hearing you right that that's more in terms of the curriculum in terms of the addressing mental health yeah I think it's more of just setting priorities um, like I said student achievement is extremely important um, but to be labeling things, I guess, um, there's, there's a lot of important things that we should be addressing. Thank you. I'll look to how to make sure we're incorporating that in a way that reflects what you're talking about. Other input in terms of, do we leave anything out? Do we, do we have something in here that we don't need? Just as a general, like a specific major, let's talk about, I guess, major activities. So this is our, um, I, let me also turn it over to give an opportunity for Dr. Malash for Marta, who's an integral part of this. Um, I don't know if there's anything that you wanna add or speak about or. No, I mean, I, and I appreciate the discussion, you know, and, and everybody providing the input, it helps to clarify um, some of the things we'll have to talk about process, what's that, you know, next steps, what does that look like uh, in terms of, of where we wanna go? You know, just a reminder that the three categories, um, you know, student wellness, purpose, and passion, and that can be on the classrooms. Those three overarching goals were adopted by the board in 2020, you know, after a significant amount of time and input from across the community, different stakeholder groups, they were adopted as the overarching goals from 2020 through 2025. And so that is what, what um, you know, we use to guide uh, the process so that there is continuity um, that's there. You know, you, somebody mentioned earlier, it, it's difficult to identify uh, goals at this level um, that are just truly for one year. Um, you know, so often it carries over in terms of, of what takes place. Um, ideally, adopting the goals in August, you know, is, is a goal for us because um, it allows the, uh, you know, the, the schools to be focused on what they're doing. You know, the building goals are built based on what the district goals are. Um, you know, in terms of what's there. Yeah, the, the biggest thing, question we would have administratively then is just next steps. So what, you know, what's the board looking for? You know, we've done revisions. There's been discussion at a number of different levels. Um, you know, what's, what's next step look like? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, we're gonna add in some tie over with last year's goals as, as um, and I thought will be Dr. Rude, Mr. Mayer, and I think Dr. Malash will work together on that. That makes sense to everybody. Um, and then I think there's some feedback we've gotten tonight and I'm happy to try to take a stab at it or we can do it as a group with Dr. Malash as well, the team. So we're to so, uh, work together. Um, and then, I mean, we have, one more meeting in July and one, and then we get into August. So I know we want to, so I think if we can try to, I'm going to put people on the spot, but maybe in the next week and a week, get this work done and then get a draft out today's Tuesday. Try to get something out early next week to everybody um, to review. Is that too aggressive of a timeline? I, yeah, I mean, I would say by middle of next week, by by next Wednesday, you know, I don't know that today's Tuesday, you know, we have folks working Wednesday, Thursday. Um, yeah, so it becomes a challenge. 
but I would say middle of next week, Wednesday, you know, Thursday morning, be able to set it out. You know, and, and then it's just a matter of, you know, because we can certainly have a discussion at the meeting on the 26th, you know, during an old business portion, just as we are doing this evening, um, you know, and, and valuable for folks to go through, you know, if, if there are questions, if there are points, you know, to address, you know, so that we are, are ready to go. Um, so yeah, definitely do it. Yeah, that would be great. And I guess it, my, my request is if, if possible, um, once we everyone gets that next week to really take a hard look at it, make sure it really reflects our conversation, specifically reflects input that you gave and you as in the plural, you each of each and every one of you. Um, so that when we are at our next meeting, we all, I think, can be at a place of clarity about what what else needs to be done to be able to finalize this. That's my thought. Does that, does that feel right? Make sense, folks? And and I appreciate the discussion, you know, that Ms. Arreo brought up and that Dr. Rude, um, you know, kind of went through with it. There, there's a piece about what that report out looks like and what that looks like for the board and, and for the administrative team as we're going through the year um, that certainly we can continue to work on it and discuss. It doesn't necessarily need to be a part of what's included for the adoption of the goals or what becomes that public document, you know, that goes out to the schools and to the community and, and to that kind of thing as well. I mean, is that okay? If, I think we talked about having kind of that separate page, which part of it is space too, but part of it too is is making sure that it's an it's a working document that is it's part of it. We're good with that that separate piece. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, Mrs. Fleischer. I keep not looking at the screen, and I don't want to neglect you. So, um, okay, I just want to make sure you didn't have your hand up or anything. Just say so. Okay, all right. Anybody else going once, going twice? Um, Dr. Reed. Um, so just to kind of follow up on the, on those two comments. So like, I agree with uh, Dr. Malosh that, um, you know, and I'll talk more as I, you know, as I, I'll, I'll try to kind of get the temperature of like where we are, but it seems like, like the board document, like what the way this is presented tonight is the same as what's in the, on the website as the board goals. So that I think is, you know, as, as Dr. Malacha said, should be what we try to pass forward through the board as the official, you know, the district goals for the year, but that we should work to um, have a level of communication and documentation, uh, both for, I mean, this would be helpful both hopefully to the administration, although it, you know, they, I know they have so many resources, but this would be helpful also to the board members to be able to, you know, have a better way of tracking things going forward. And if we can come up with uh, systems that the board can use and doc, like documents, document frameworks that the board can use to improve our process going forward, that would be helpful too. So, so that, um, you know, uh, is, that's what I, what I'd like to, hopefully be able to help a little bit with. Um, and um, so I'll, I'll reach out to people. This full thing, that's okay. Just no, sure. the, the one for 21, 22 is on the website. And so this, it's the same format though, the 22, 23. I think that is that you were just the same with the columns. To clarify, that's what I meant. The format that you're seeing in this document right here is the same format as what's published for the, the 2021-2022 school year on the district website. And so we'll try to, I think we're, our goal is to put the goal, find another word. Our, our objective is to uh, create a document that is similar to what is already posted on the website to, to present again. But I think that this meeting we've identified specific needs for another type of communication and documentation um, that allows us to better kind of track the evolution. Yeah, I would just add, I, I think, you know, in the, in the corporate board table, it's hard to do a lot of this work. I think the individual meetings would be good because, yeah, to Mrs. Arroyo's point earlier, there needs to be a joint level of ownership. I think we kind of, you know, we want to expedite expedition. There's a lot of value to it, but it's got to be shaped because especially once we start moving toward a I would say the people who need to shape it at this point most are the people who weren't on the committee, Dr. Malash, you know, figure kind of that out. 
But once this becomes public, it becomes it, it has a power. Now, here's what the power is. The power is not to define everything that we're doing. This is about, you know, so frankly, sustainability, just an example. We could take it out. We could work on sustainability this year. Um, but what we want to make sure is that this is crystal clear. And we also want to avoid the unintended consequences of put something out that, you know, is really alienating people, which is the last thing we want to do. So I think that is the work. Um, I would expedite it, but I, I would at this point say, let's let's make sure we, we're looking at maybe the earliest to adopt the goals would be the first full meeting of, of, of August, maybe the second. One of us won't be here, but anyway, so fair. Okay, great. I think that's everything. Thanks everybody. Great discussion. Uh, let me sanity check for, for board members. Do people want a couple minute break? We do have a couple of other pieces of business. I already took my bio break. So, but is anyone just keep, keep rolling? We shall keep rolling. Um, that brings us to, oh, okay. going once. You had food, keep going. <laughs> nah, I wish I had food, but um, I'm losing weight as we speak, which is, which is that, that part's probably okay. Okay, so second public comment. This is the second public comment during which you may comment on any topic. If you would like to speak now, please clearly state your name and municipality. We will alternate between speakers here in the room and those that are online. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak. The timer on the screen will indicate the amount of time you have remaining. Cherry Hill is a community that values education and educational topics often bring out a passionate response. The Cherry Hill Board of Education supports a school climate in which our diversity is a source of strength and all are included. Respect is foundational in how we treat you, how we treat each other, and how we support our administration and staff in their essential work. Please join us in practicing the utmost respect for all. And I will start as is traditional in the room with the first speaker, if there is one. Yes, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, once again, I'm Tom Howard, a teacher of history for 22 years at Cherry Hall High School East. Uh, to the two board members who voted no on the transfers, transfers tonight, I want to say thank you. To the rest, I want to express my extreme disappointment, sadness. You have listened to thousands of students, alumni, community members, uh, sibling, uh, I'm sorry, children of the affected teachers. And yet, to me, the message is, we don't care. To me, the message was, we don't see you as individuals. We see you as cogs in the machine. And it's demoralizing, it's humiliating, and it's sad to me as somebody who has dedicated my professional life to this district for 22 years. I have seen colleagues in tears over the thought of leaving a community they have loved and dedicated their lives to. I have listened in anguish to my dear friend, tell me that he can't sleep, he can't read, he shakes at the thought of leaving a community that he loves so much. And personally, we talk about wellness and the importance of wellness, which is super important for students, but also for the adults put in charge of being the stewards of those kids. Ever since this, this, these proposed transfers have come down, I will tell you, I have suffered panic attacks. I've been on medication for, uh, for, for my nerves at the thought of not only losing my friends and colleagues, but at the thought, will I be next? Will the 22 years that I've put in be gone like that? And yeah, I can go to a new school. And as Mr. Melagrana so eloquently said, I, I, I will dedicate myself wholeheartedly to wherever I might be. The fact is, we've, we and my colleagues who have moved have shed blood, sweat, tears at these buildings. And whether, I know it's not intentional, but the message that I can't help take away from it and others can't take away from it is, we don't care. Thank you. Thank you. 
we'll go to the line for Dr. Padovitz. I'm, I'm Jeff Potowitz, um, and I live in Cherry Hill. That's going to be hard to follow. Um, okay. Do a Google search for NJ Education Aid and search this blog for is SFRA, um, is SFRA for to, fair to South Jersey? All right. South Jersey pers persistently feels that it is disrespected by North Jersey and disadvantage in lawmaking and budgeting. New Jersey Education Aid agrees that SFRA does have an unjustified tilt against South Jersey. One specific reason is basic local fair share calculations are not only equalized valuation, but equally on aggregate income. Why? Because SFRA's predecessors did that going back to Governor Jim Florio's QEA of 1990. So why did the Quality Education Act use income? Answer, to give less money to South Jersey. That's Cherry Hill, and it worked. This is according to Deborah Jaffe's book entitled Other People's Children. So read the article, all right? Note, under, under QEA, our... Our direct state aid to education was cut from $20.5 million to approximately $15.3 million in one year. Over the next few years, the cuts continue to a low of approximately $10.9 million. Got it? If you do a Google search for SFRA district profile and click on the link to SFRA district profile education law center, you can use a drop-down menu and see graphs for all the school districts, including Cherry Hill. In the first year of what we have now, SFRA, our required state aid was $28.8 million. We received 16.5. You will note under 2011 that the state aid was reduced to $7.9 million in one year. If you go to the graphs, the graph point, 10, 2014, our required state A formula aid was $44.3 million. We received $12.7 million. That's $30 million. We were cheated by the state by over that $30 million in one year alone. For next year, we will hopefully receive in direct state aid to education approximately $29 million. That's hope. <laughs> Dr. Podowitz, thank you. And I know you often follow up with uh, an email if you'd like to uh, send us your full comments. We'd appreciate that. Moving to the room, Mr. Short. Rick Short, 1002 Shelton Parkway. Um, sir, your speech was incredible. I could never make a speech like that. Thank you for your service. Um, you know, if we look around in this room, I, 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 I will admit I don't have the highest IQ. I'm not the, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I think I have some common sense. I think I have a high amount of common sense. And I'll tell you what, this board just doesn't have any common sense. I mean, you just, you just left the East teachers out to dry. There's people that have commented tonight that, oh, East teachers are, are transferred and it's gonna bring more education. No, it's not gonna bring more education to Cruci. It's gonna bury one of their teachers, you know? And, and where's the common sense? $210 million, $210 million bond first time, couldn't get it passed on a zero. So what do you come back next with? 363 million, 74% of the people in the community are under hardship, but you guys forge ahead. Where is the common sense? And I'll tell you what the big, big, big common sense tonight, Miss 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 Arroyo. I I want to thank you. I want to kiss 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 you, not kiss you, but just uh, praise you. I mean, what we what we wis, witnessed tonight was called implicit bias from the district. Now let me read this because this all goes back to that horrible word of equity that everything has to be the same. Let's see what happened when when that 
thing was written about that. Implicit bias, a tendency for a procedure or practice of a particular institution to operate in a way that results in certain social gatherings being advantaged or favored. When you said about the Latinos being considered, uh, you know, disadvantaged, that upset you. Yes, that upset me too. Everything in this district is based around race. And until you understand that, until you understand that the Malash administration is directly doing everything to segregate, you will keep, keep fighting in the community. Let me continue on with this. Being disadvantaged, this may not be the result of any conscious prejudgments or discrimination, but rather the majority simply following existing rules or norms. The district saying that is segregation and we need to take this out. Our goal should be in this district to praise our teachers, to praise our students, and not to segregate. Because in 28 videos of one minute videos, all we did was segregate groups. And until this district understands that, and until this board understands that, everything is just gonna get worse in this town. And more people are gonna learn about what's happening and how race is based around everything that's For done. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we don't have anyone raising their hand online. Uh, I will return in the room. Would anyone like to come up to the mic? All right, if not, uh, we'll close public comment and we will turn to Dr. Malash for superintendent comments that he may want to um, let us know about. Thank you, Mr. Vadia. Uh, I appreciate the uh, the opportunity. I want to thank everybody that that spoke tonight. Uh, especially want to thank Liliana for you know the the courage and the ability to come up and speak at the microphone. Um, it takes a lot. It takes a lot for adults to get up to the microphone, um, especially you know for a young lady to be able to get up and and to speak so passionately and so eloquently. Uh, she did a beautiful job. Uh, I want to applaud her efforts, you know, in being able to put that together and and what she did. Uh, and being so articulate. So I'm thankful for that. Um, there's been a, a, a lot of discussion over the course of the last three months, um, almost exactly the last three months, about teacher transfer. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, tonight on the agenda, there were nearly 50 people, um, certificated staff members that were reassigned, um, some who were identified by the district for reassignment, some who stood up and said they wanted to be reassigned, some who put in to be reassigned, but about 50 people, um, they join a, a group of uh, six or so other people that were approved in June, um, child study team members, you know, who um, we, we do that approval in June because, you know, the position starts in July, you know, with the summer work. Um, this is something, unfortunately, that takes place in school districts, you know, every single year. Um, our focus is always as a school district on the students, um, you know, and, and what is it that we can do uh, to benefit students in the best way possible. Um, and, and Tom, you're right, the, you know, the, the most important piece, uh, the most important resource that we have in school district is the staff, it's the human resource. There is no question about that. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't difficult decisions that have to be made um, and decisions that are made to promote, to develop, to enhance, the environment, the opportunity, and the experience for the students, um, you know, and, and that comes through with it. Um, the greatest human resource, the greatest resource that we have truly is the human resource. So I appreciate the passion with which uh, folks spoke uh, this evening about the different uh, transfers and the different positions. We have heard from people uh, in the community as well. Um, student voice, uh, I'm an incredible proponent for student voice. We talk a lot about student voice. Um, it's an important piece of what we do and how we operate as a school district, what goes on in the schools. Uh, we hear discussion about student voice uh, pretty regularly now, which I, I think is a tremendous advancement uh, for us as a school district. Um, enhancing student voice and amplifying student voice and nurturing student voice doesn't necessarily mean that when students say that we turn and act based on exactly what it is that they say. Uh, it means that we get input, that we get perspective, that, that we want them to share uh, about their experiences. Um, and then decisions sometimes are made, much like we make decisions at home 
with our families, much like we make decisions or the board makes decisions or we make decisions in schools. We take input. It doesn't mean that people aren't heard uh, if their side is not the one that is taken. Um, I can tell you the, the many voices that we have heard from um, certainly have, have um, you know, gone to the board. The board has heard. We've had more discussion uh, in the last three months, as I said, than, you know, than we've had in a number of years. Um, Mr. Short, I'll, I'll offer again to meet with you. Um, you know, I, we, we do this or I do this at basically at each board meeting. You get up and, and you make comments um, that, are, that are baseless, that are incorrect. Um, I, I think we need to sit down so we can talk about operational definitions of words. Um, I've never looked to segregate students, much the opposite. To stand up there in the microphone and, and say that I'm trying to segregate children or to segregate people couldn't be farther from the truth. I, I really encourage you, you, you know how to get a hold of us, you know, and rather than than taking a different rather than than taking a rather than taking a different bend, you know, and, and sharing things, come in and sit down and have if you truly want to have a conversation, truly want to have a conversation, come in and have a conversation. You know, Mr. Mrs. Short, Cohen. you're going to have to hold your horses back. Let this look. We we give you time every meeting. That time has elapsed. We just need to schedule the time and come in and sit down and have the conversation. Uh, I I really think that would benefit you. You've been passionate about the school district. There is no denying that. We've spent time meeting over the course of the last seven years. Come in and sit down. Okay, but don't stand up here and say that. I never in my career or in my life would look to segregate children or segregate people. Couldn't be farther from the truth, right? That That's just, the, that's baseless in terms of, of what you say. And I think, uh, Mr. Avadia, that's it. Uh, just a reminder, as Mr. Avadia mentioned, folks that are interested in applying for the empty board seat uh, due by four o'clock on Monday the 18th. Uh, the board will discuss on the 20th in exec session uh, you know, prior to the CNI. Um, retreat. We will let the people know that are being identified for an interview on the 21st. Uh, those interviews will take place on the 26th here in the boardroom prior to the regular uh, board meeting. Next Wednesday, 12 to 2, uh, meals will be distributed at High School East. That'll continue yeah. through August 31st. Uh, any township resident between the ages of 3 and 18, uh, if it's township resident who's enrolled in our district that's with us until they are 21, certainly are eligible as well. Uh, if you have questions, you have concerns, reach out to one of us. Mrs. Wilson will publish and continue to push out that information about where else to reach out. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Dr. Malash. Um, I will make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Do I have a second? Dr. Rood and all in favor, please raise your hand. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you.